This week's episode of This Is Only in Test is made possible by McAfee's new podcast, Hackable. Cybercrime has been all over the news and TV shows. Hackable, an original podcast from McAfee, answer the question, how worried should I really be? In each episode, host Jeff Siskin invites a hacker to try and hack a device he's using. In season three, Jeff straps on a virtual reality headset, puts his laptop password on the line, investigates drones, and more. Listen to Hackable now on all major podcast platforms. Hey, let's start the show. For Thursday, January 3rd, 2019, welcome to This Is Only a Test, the official podcast of Tested.com. Hello, everyone, and Happy New Year 2019. Here we go, a new year of podcasts. I'm Norm, joined by our regular stable of awesome co-hosts, Jeremy Williams. I can think of no better way than to ring in the new year than to spend it with two of my closest friends doing a podcast. That's very sweet of you, but there's like at least a million better ways to ring the new year. Uh, the new year has already been rung in a couple days ago, and I want to hear about it because I don't think we've seen each other since we recorded the last podcast, which may have been, yeah, it was before Christmas is when we recorded a podcast. We unfortunately didn't have one last week, uh, but how did you spend your holiday break? I got to tell you, my new year's was epic. I went to bed early, and I fell asleep playing Mario Odyssey oh, because I'm racing nice. my kid in how many uh, moons? Because you got him a Switch. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. He's had a Switch for a while, but I've been way behind on my moon collecting, mm-hmm. and now I'm catching up, and he hasn't. he doesn't collect any coins, and I'm just buying up moons. So no adult diapers? No doing a Fortnite dance? No. With Ninja? No. In Times Square? None of that? Did you hear what happened in Fortnite at New Year's? On at 12 o'clock? In Fortnite. In Fortnite. Okay, what happened? Yeah, yeah, because I, I have a son who plays Fortnite. And he was like, Dad, Dad, Dad. I gotta, oh, I my gotta, goodness. I got to be on the computer. And I was like, well, <laughs> is it is it East Coast midnight or is it West Coast midnight? And he's yeah. like, oh, wow, maybe it's 9 o'clock. So we went down. No, you have to wait till midnight your time. Oh, so it's different. So if you go on Fortnite at midnight, everyone is forced to dance. Doing the uh, the I, the side, I think whatever you want. Oh, first, but a, okay. a giant ball comes down from the sky, and a dance off begins. You are you may not fight. You can't fight. Like they take You're in away the of the round. They take away your ability to engage. What if it's like in the last two people? And there's <laughs> I, only two people left. I'm sure there's a YouTube out there where that happened. And they're like well, they're hunting each other. Like I'm, I, I guess they are the last kill of 2018. Exactly. And then they're forced to dance. And then you have to dance. All I saw was uh, that ninja was on a, a rockin', New, Rockefeller New Year's Eve thing. Wasn't was it in Times Square? I don't know. He was in New York, yeah. right? And trying to get a million people to, to do a Fortnite dance. And, and any dance? I think like five people danced. It was also really cold. Oh, that's no It good. was in the rain. It- <laughs> people have all sorts of New Year rituals. And I think as you go older, the ritual becomes, and I'm feeling this definitely, because it, it becomes not participating or... Like, not going out. Uh, I celebrated the Pacific time changeover with a change of a diaper. Oh. Yeah, I was mid-diaper change. Happy New Year to you. Mid-diaper change in in the new year. Uh, But if you look online, I I congratulate all the people who uh, go all out and try to do, like, a a Star Wars sync up. Have you seen these? Nope. They play Star Wars on their TV, Uh and they sync it up so uh, as... It ca- the countdown happens. The Death Star. Yeah. Well, it's the Death Star countdown. Oh wow! Right. So it's the ten nine eight seven six, and then right. Happy New Year. Are the Death Star blows up? Are those actual seconds in the movie? No, they're not. So you sync up the explosion. You sync up the explosion. I think to he fires the, the New Year. I think the torpedoes enter the the shaft like at eight. Yeah, it does. Like there's a way. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's a ways before wow. it actually explodes. I like that. That's a clever way to do it. And then people film their reaction videos to get that timing perfectly. Actually, yeah. some people do screen captures if they play it on their laptops and just have, if you're in Windows, <laughs> you can have a live clock down to the second in the bottom right-hand corner. Yeah. A new one this past year that I saw was the Thanos snap at New Year's. Oh, that's no good. You, you time it to watch Infinity War, which is on Netflix on Christmas, to to snap right as the year turned over. And, you know, they call there's a new name for the snap now. Marvel is officially called calling it the, the dec- snapping. No, no, it's the, the dusting. The, no, they're calling it the decimation. What? Which is mathematically incorrect. <laughs> Why? What is it? What is a decimation? A decimation is ten percent. It's one of the you know, if you're a pendant. Interesting. T- decimation in colloquial terms means a devastating, yeah. right? It, where maybe ten percent is left. Yeah. But a, a decimation. I think it goes back to, what is it, um, Roman times? Uh-huh. Um, it's only 10% is removed. Like a decimal. It, it, uh, uh, it's base 10, yeah. right? So yeah. it's you, it's a form of punishment, I think I believe it was. Interesting. Uh, so anyway, those are some of the New Year's rituals. I, of course, I, as I said earlier, did a diaper change we, uh, we to did... bring in a change to the New Year. How, how about you, Jeremy? <laughs> I was programming at midnight. I, I was having a good time programming, yeah, working are, on a project. We are adults. That, that does not speak to anything but just how little I think of New Year's at my 44th year of life. Yeah. It's like, it's just, it's just midnight. <laughs> it's fun. The kids are up. They're having a good time. That, that's all that matters. My watch showed me fireworks. I've never seen that before. Oh. But over the break, we had a good time because we have this uh, new thing that we do in the family where we all put ideas into a pot, things we could do together. Oh, and then and nice. then we go around the room and we say, how many people really want to do this? And the things that have three or four votes... They get included, and then we have them on the wall, and then we pick things to do. We went roller skating. Wow. Nice. Like a roller rink? Did you know you could do that in San Francisco? At yes, a rink, I did. right? There's a rink called the Church of the Eight Wheels. Mm-hmm. Church of the Eight Wheels. Which, which nice. is actually a church. It's an old been church, converted yeah. into a roller skating rink. Okay, and get pizza, it, some got, root beer. I don't know. No, there's, there's snacks, but it's all packaged stuff. But they play the right music. It's a very 80s thing. They're playing the music from the 70s and the, oh. in the 80s, and it's just fantastic. You rent skates and you skate around for an hour. It's You're fantastic. A, a stranger our, Things mood. Our friend Herbie um, had his engagement party at a roller rink mm. out in Antioch, and it was like a Friday night yeah. in, I want to say, like early summer. Bum, 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 and it bum, was bum, bum, it was bum, like bum, a bum. throwback to like suburban high school days because like all of a sudden all the teenage crowd just shows up while we're skating at this rink. <laughs> Music changes. Very nice. It was actually pretty great. Yeah, we were off for a little over a week here at Tested, and um, I stayed home. I left the house twice, once to watch a movie, which we'll talk about um, in pop culture news, mm-hmm. and once I did spend New Year's Eve over with at Will's place. Actual midnight New Year's Eve? No, we left before midnight. <laughs> yeah, there's <laughs> no chance. <laughs> no, we, <laughs> we left at like 10 p.m. Gotcha. We saw we saw the East 10 p.m. Coast Pretty New, impressive. New Year, and then we're like, we played board games. Uh, Will, his wife, and I played uh, tabletop games. And, oh, and yeah. And we make pork buns. Oh, shoot. What's this game called? Decrypto. We, we got a new game for Christmas called Decrypto. Yeah? And it's fun. You split into two teams, and you have to communicate something to your team without letting the other team intercept your communication and decipher what it is you're trying to say. And it's it's enjoyable. We had a good time with that nice. one. Uh, the t- three games that we played, uh, Machi Koro. Yeah. Have you heard of that one? Yeah, I played mm-hmm. it. Uh, which I, I had not played before. It was It's very fun. It's a city-building game. Mm-hmm. Um, Sushi Go. Sushi yep. Go is awesome. awesome. Uh, that was really fun. This apparently is an iPad, iPhone version. All it did was make me want sushi, mm-hmm. though. Uh, and then Splendor. Never Splendor really, is great. Don't know that one. Um, and that's another, uh, like Manchu Yukora, a point building mm-hmm. race. Uh, Two of those goal. three games were in my favorite videos. Favorite yeah. things video. Well, they were on the table. They're on the table. But yeah. you didn't. But the one you mentioned was Dragonwood. Yeah. Well, and I didn't play Dragonwood. Which I can vouch, that's a great family game. Oh. It's like very intro to RPG kind of thing. I also played board games over the holiday break. We went to Yosemite as a family. And met um, my wife's uh, uh, family there. 
which is interesting because we got to Yosemite a day after the government shutdown began. Right. Was there anyone there to let you in? So Yosemite's all of its stuff, like the shuttle, the hotels, all of that, it's run by a con- uh, concessionaire. And most of the big national parks, it's like that, like Yellowstone's like that. And so basically you don't know that the park is in shutdown except for a couple crucial things. And they're pretty crucial. Bathrooms. So one is that the uh, entrance gate is just open. There's That's no one there. So you don't pay anything. Crazy. Which felt awful. Yeah. And we ended up donating money to the Yosemite Parks Conservancy equal to that kind of uh, entrance fee. And then the visitor center is closed. And then like the bathrooms that are sort of park managed are not taken care of. Yikes. And so... In the first couple days, like the staff was really nice and everyone was really, uh, all the guests I think were really kind of apologetic because it's a kind of crappy situation. Um, it was awesome being in Yosemite at, at Christmas time, my first time there. Uh, they built an ice skating rink like in the village, like below Half Dome. So I'm skating there with my son and uh, a guy just totally like wipes out and hits his head on the ice and he's bleeding. It happens. Um, but the park service is in charge of emergency response. So I'm sitting there like what happens now? But so like a ranger that is not being paid has to like respond with like medical staff that is not being paid as well. And so to see that, that they're still working, even though they're not being paid, like really just emphasized how hard it is for a lot of people amidst the shutdown. Yeah. Stories started to emerge. And now that we're entering like a couple weeks about how, the parks are becoming kind of uh, a trouble spot, let's just say, um, with people. Red Dead in- Redemption. Increasing bad behavior. I saw a little bit. Like, we saw, we ran into a couple coyotes in this meadow. I mean, they're a little ways off. They were just hunting. And, the and like, normally, like, there would be, like, rangers surveilling and stuff. And this family just started, like, yelling at the coyotes and trying to, like, pose in oh, pictures with them and no. stuff. And it's like clearly like this is like there's behavior like that that I think is emerging with the toilets not being kept up and garbage overflowing. There's potential for damage. So hopefully the shutdown ends soon or they should just close the parks because there's potential damage coming. Mm. But it was awesome being in a national park at at Christmas time. There's a little bit of snow overnight leading into Christmas morning. Mm -hmm. And uh, we sat by a fire and played a ton of board games. Uh, I don't know about my choice of playing Pandemic over and over again about bringing holiday cheer because that's not really a game that makes you celebrate life. But, you know, whatever. It was still a lot of fun. I got some breaking news. Super mm. sad. Uh-oh. Terrible way to start off the year. Um, Super Dave. Super Dave Osborne? Osborne had just passed. Oh, Bob no. uh, Einstein. If he was in Curb Your Enthusiasm. Yeah. Super sad. Just want to throw it out there. Started putting down her note. Mean Gene Okerlund also passed away this morning. Yeah. Uh, all right. What were some of the other things you did, Jeremy? Because you had a whole list of... Uh... <laughs> well, I gave you the best one. Honestly, the roller skating was the best. But yeah. we also went rowing in Stowe Lake, which is... Oh! It's a neat lake in the center of Golden Gate Park. It's so secluded. This is what, We had a lot of questions for people who um, visit San Francisco and want to find things to do. And there are some... If you have, like, only like a weekend in San Francisco, you're going to go to California Academy of Sciences, maybe Exploratorium. I definitely recommend going to Walt Disney Family Museum. A lot of restaurants, of course. But most San Franciscans actually have never done this one thing because in the middle of Golden Gate Park, there is a lake. And the only way you can get into this lake is in this narrow entrance, one-way street that you have to kind of off this main um, this main through pass. You make a left, and then you like, drive around this lake. It's like, it's like a hidden lake and pagoda and hill in Golden Gate Park. And you can rent boats. You can rent paddle boats or rowboats. What did you guys do? We did a paddle boat. Paddle I mean, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We did a rowboat. Oh, you ro- oh. The rowboats are cheaper and they're more fun. And they are more fun because I you, disagree. Can, you can take turns and the person rowing is in charge of the family and where they're going. And whether they're going to hit the wall or whether they're going to ro- hit the duck or go ashore. Hit the duck? It, it is a doing? rite of passage. <laughs> By the way, to get in a paddle boat and to go not in the direction that you want yeah. and to go into some bushes. Yeah. Like that is just everyone does it. You know what gets the kids out is, is Pokemon. So that <laughs> it was contingent on allowing Pokemon 
that we go to the park. Were they trying to capture Pokemon? Their theory was if they go on the lake, there might be better water Pokemon. That's cool. That's nice. That's nice Jedi mind tricking <laughs> your kids. Well, that, that's all of them. Uh, but of course, there aren't. Yeah. There aren't. You get great lunch there. There's a little boathouse. That's the best secret. Like yeah. that is one of the best places to eat in in the park. Mm-hmm. It's really cool. And and they allow dogs on the boats. Just giving you a heads up. We also walked along the Embarcadero one day. We went bowling. I didn't know you could bowl in San Francisco. You can There's bowl. a Where few do you places. Go bowling? I know. Did you go to Presidio Bowl? That's the way to go. That it's, one. If I you knew. go downtown on King Street. That's just the. That's expensive hipster bowling. Yep, that's right. Presidio that, Bowl. You can still get a beer in the shape of a bowling pit. <laughs> <laughs> really? It's Budweiser, but it's still. Fun. I didn't know about the one downtown. That's actually where we went. I knew about the Presidio one. Ah. Oh. Yeah. All right. Yeah. But we had a good time. That's good. That's great. Uh, it's, any... it's not over yet. Oh, oh, oh. I don't know. No, I'm just saying that they, their vacation. Oh, their vacation. <laughs> yeah. The kids, the kids are off until next Monday. That's crazy. This Monday. Wow. That's nuts. Two weeks. Ah, oh, that's crazy. crazy. I remember looking forward to that every year. Uh, how about gifts? No. Um, we can talk about gifts received, but we can all talk about gifts given. What were some of your best gifts that you received and best gifts that you oh gave? My gosh. My Let's kid, start with Kishore. My kid got too much stuff. Uh, I got him a Labo kit that he hadn't had before, and we spent some time building that, and that was uh, easily one of the best parts of the, of the Christmas uh, time. Uh, we, uh, My wife got me a scavenger hunt gift. What's like that? A, an app that like takes you around... Um, San Francisco to like hidden spots and you learn about history and you have really? to go walking as a family. So you should like do geocaching. Experience. We have done geocaching. <laughs> okay. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the geocache spots that I used to go to are now uh, defunct. They're found by muggles. Yeah, too many. Gentrified geocaching. <laughs> oh no. What? Geocache gentrification. No, he's, People, he's, saying, he's saying that they're gone. Yeah, these people just, have, have dug. Oh, oh, it's not that you now there's a new like breakfast brunch place where the geocache used to be. Oh, right. <laughs> like, you built it on top yeah, of the geocache. Exactly. <laughs> this, <laughs> this happy hour hipster cocktail bar didn't need to be here. I There's treasure underneath your foot, bartender. Uh, my, my son got a, a lock picking kit. Oh, <laughs> nice. Yeah, because he actually picked a padlock last year with a bobby pin and was so happy with himself yeah that we got him a, my mom actually got him a lock pick kit and he's freaky good at it now he's freaky good like he went to, he had to find more locks to pick because he's run he's run out of them at home so he went to the hardware store and spent forty dollars of his own money buying locks on the best padlocks he could buy that's awesome and he brought them home and picked them in seconds this is a super <laughs> criminal yeah. in training is he you, now you're just gonna be like walk down the street go go play Go take your kid out. Actually, See, what I say is the lockpick kit does not leave the house. Is that understood? <laughs> <laughs> so that, that, that's where we're at. You know, that. it's actually very useful for in the house. Have you ever locked yourself out of your own rooms in your house? Um, I mean, we have doors where you put put a pin in them and they unlock. Oh, I have some doors that don't, mm. and I've locked myself out of rooms and had had take had needed to take out a lockpick kit with that require a yes. key. Yes. Wow. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I, no, I believe it will be a useful skill. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, any any fun gifts you you gave or were given, Jeremy? Um, well, all, my gifts weren't a huge hit. Oddly, like I'm very competitive at Christmas, so I was a little disappointed with myself. Competitive like, in terms of giving. Yeah, exactly. So my wife won all the giving. Like she gave this thing called My Bro to our eight year old daughter, which is a little robot that you drive around and you can talk through it and listen from it, and uh, it's just like an RC robot, but it has a lot of personality. I gave her this amazing you build it yourself unicorn and program it yourself kit. It's still in the shrink wrap. Oh, no. <laughs> so I'm still waiting to experience that. I also got that, that sounds more like a gift that you want to enjoy by proxy. I don't yeah, I don't appreciate you saying that it's a spoiled thing, but I I I do think she will enjoy it too once we open it. <laughs> it's a bowling ball. I also gave them something called Turing Tumble. Which is I, we have also in the shrink wrap. <laughs> is it also programming related? It is. It is basically programming related. I think it's, there's a trend here. It's marbles <laughs> that you that fall down a marble uh, maze. Oh, that's amazing! And the way that they that. fall is a bit controlled by these little logic gates that you put onto the it's physical to the grid. I'll it's, come it's, over it's and a put that. cards. That's amazing. Good. All right, good. It's, it's like uh, programming with cards. Uh, I I don't know. What Combine you mean. With, with punch cards. Yeah. Yeah. Punch card plinko. 
Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's simpler than that, but yeah. Yeah, you, but they're little plastic pieces that control how the That's very neat. Is. I thought so, You know, too. if if your daughter doesn't want them, just bring them here. We'll <laughs> yeah, play, we'll, we'll play, we'll with, play with them <laughs> here might, on the podcast. It might, it might come to that. Yeah, very nice. Um, I, what did I give and receive? Oh, You had uh, a hard act, Batman. Yes. That thing I saw. That was a self-gift, though. Yeah. That was a, that was something I bought, like, months ago, and it arrived. Uh, Amondo... Batman. I rewatched a lot of Batman animated series. Actually, um, the Blu-ray HD set came out, and um, the, the quality is very good. What, um, what about your headphones? Oh yeah, so I gave and received a pair of headphones. Oh, um, new Sony headphones. I'm looking for noise canceling headphones because I got a recommendation on Twitter from uh, Devendra over at Engadget uh, to use noise canceling, active noise canceling headphones uh, to. To take the edge off a screaming baby scream. <laughs> so it doesn't <laughs> completely muffle. It just gets the edge off. I didn't know that's why you got it. Right? So the baby screams a lot. And so I got Danica and myself a pair of Sony noise canceling headphones. Apparently this year's were very well reviewed. The MX3s, uh, they, they rank very well against the, the Bose act, active noise canceling headphones. And they are a revelation. I did not know noise canceling, active noise canceling technology had advanced so far without sacrificing actual audio quality. Yeah. Um, so I'm very happy with these headphones. Yeah, I tried them this morning and I was blown away. Yeah. Uh, and then I got a, a keyboard for an iPad. And Apple, I think really, I think that they did a really good job this year with their smart failure keyboard. Uh, still crazy <laughs> expensive. Way too expensive. Um, but what, else, what, what did I give this year? Oh, uh, I got... Uh, uh, you know the movie, uh, the, the TV short, uh, the animated short Bow from Pixar? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I got Danica a Bow Funko. Oh, they made one? They made one. It comes in a little uh, steamer. Oh, that's cute. Yeah. How many ba- from the Bow line are there? Just the one? Just the Bow. Just the one Bow. Oh, it's it's the it's, it's the Bow. It's the Bow? <laughs> it's the Bow. I gave her a baby Bow. <laughs> wow. It seems like it would have been more hilarious if you gave that to your mom. Yeah. I don't think she'd get it. I don't think she saw it short though so she wouldn't have gotten it yeah but those were the it was free on youtube there's no excuse yeah, i know i know that was you should download it right now before they take it off it's probably gone the... it was only on for a week i think oh that's disappointing all right oh and i got ripley uh pet insurance so uh okay we were given recommendation uh wire cutter actually recommended this getting pet insurance and, and if you have a dog or cat you know over the lifespan of your your pet it might be worth it financially the premiums aren't that bad if it's you're medical uh, insurance. Medical insurance. All right. Yeah. And Ripley did have a minor injury over the break. So is Ripley okay? We think so. We're, we're still figuring it out. Okay. We're take her to the vet. But uh she's she's she plays hard. Um, but anyway, let's get to our top story this week. All right. What's it going to be? So I think we all unanimously decided this. Uh, surprise drop over the holiday break via Netflix. A bunch of like Netflix stuff happened over the holiday break. But the one I think that we cared about the most was Black Mirror Season 5, Episode 0, Bandersnatch. Do all the seasons have an Episode 0? No. Oh. Uh, the Black Mirror, as I understood it, and I know this because I got the, the inside Black Mirror book. So it was a uh, UK production first, did two seasons, and then Netflix picked it up, and they did a holiday special in the UK. So, you know, UK, they'll do they did three episodes per season. They're movie length, so three movies, much like Sherlock. And then, as opposed to producing a third season, initially they did a, um, a Christmas special, which was like an extra long episode, hmm. um, three-part episode, uh, anthology episode. And then did a whole third season, I believe fourth season, is yeah third and fourth season. This is the fourth, and this is the fifth season. This is the fifth. This is the beginning of the fifth season. Got it. The fourth season um, was the uh, USS Callister. That yeah, got it. Season, uh, and so there will be a whole full fifth season. This is just to. Uh, but uh, Bandersnatch delayed it. Did you not read that? I read that Bandersnatch was so complicated that it delayed the production of the rest of the season. I think it's an excuse. Excuse for what? Excuse. To for the to, to give the rest of the season more time to hmm. to meet the quality standards and also to to appease the fans because it's a long time to wait when they're essentially making three you know they're making a bunch of movies 
right? They're making not three. They're making like like these seasons are quite long, right? The the Black Mirror seasons now, uh-huh. um, but they're they're making essentially full length movies, hour and a half pieces. Yeah, and well, in the case of Bandersnatch, longer, longer because it was a f- well. Let's explain what it is before we go into it, and we will be talking spoilers. In a little bit, but we will have some pre spoil talk and we will change the lights behind us and we'll get some timestamps. Uh, if you want to, uh, listen, if you're just listening to the audio, there is a timestamp in the description that you can jump ahead to to skip all the spoiler talk. But what Bandersnatch is, uh, is that last year we heard that Black Mirror creator Charlie Brooker was experimenting with the idea of a choose your own adventure experience on Netflix. Netflix has this already, the technology is built in. Minecraft has done it. Uh, kids television primarily yep. has had the option as you're watching. I think was it Dora the Explorer? I don't know. They've had shows where kids can watch and I, or adults I, can watch. Minecraft was one of them though. Minecraft Story Mode, right? right. Yeah, and uh, you can choose at certain points, click left or right, or you know, click click the button on the remote, and you can choose a path to explore a different path of the story. And one of the interesting things, one of the complaints I actually heard was with those. Uh, the audio, they didn't read out the audio for the left to right choices. It was just text on screen. Hmm. For kids, sometimes they can't read. They would rather hear the audio to choose left to right. Interesting. So you're, you're then forced to watch it with your child okay. and prompt them left to right. Uh, but with that technology, I guess Black Mirror, Charlie Brooker wanted to take advantage of it and wrote and produced an episode directed mm-hmm. by David Slade, who also directed um, Metalhead, the previous episode of Black Mirror. That's the one with the the um, uh, the dog, the robot dog. I only still use this guy. Oh, okay. <laughs> anyway. Robot uh, dog one was Robot crazy. dog one. It's really good. You should huh. watch it. it it's it's uh, basically a, a post-apocalyptic take on um, the Boston Dynamics dogs. What oh, happens funny. In, in, when you, those ant creatures in, he- reach, their, reach their logical conclusion. It's heavily referenced in Bandersnatch. There are a bunch of past episodes referenced um but anyway uh this was a choose your own adventure and we were very excited about this premise uh we didn't know one how it'd be executed uh one of whether it would take advantage of the how it would take advantage of the the themes of black mirror of technology the overreach of technology and 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 uh we also speculated what you know what if they lock you into a certain storyline how the endings would dif- differ uh, when Netflix dropped Bandersnatch, they announced right up in the press release, this, they shot five hours of content. There's five different endings. Watch it, and it would only work on certain devices. So if you're on Apple TV, you're actually <gasps> unfortunately unable it to watch it. It doesn't work on that? It doesn't work on Apple That's TV. crazy. It only works on the consoles and the built-in TV apps, like LG TV apps. It will work. Oh. And the consoles will work. It has to do with the caching, I It believe. works on iPad. That's how I watched it. Does I it watched work? it on desktop. Desktop, of course, it works. Does not work on Oculus Go. There you go. However, people were uh, smart and they tried virtual desktop. That worked oh, fine. Great. Yeah. Um, and then, without going to spoilers, oh gosh, so we're not going to talk about the content of the episode. We'll talk about the how it works part, right? Is it, okay. You're watching it. At some point in the story, a prompt will happen. And what's cool about the way they shot and edited this, I think it's really in the editing, mm-hmm. is that the amount of time it takes for that prompt to disappear, you get uh, 10 seconds for every choice you have to make. The movie or TV show does not freeze. It's kind of like Mass Effect. It, exactly. They're, they've scripted it to give you enough of a lingering end of a scene yeah. so that by the time you make your selection, the scene ends and naturally cuts to the choice you've made. But you and, don't feel a cut. That's you the don't. thing. It's a it seamless, seamless edit. It's a seamless edit. And what happens if you don't choose one? It will automatically choose one for you. Is it random or is it always one of them? I believe it is random. I believe it's a 50-50 choice. I, people have said, I only did that once you know, people just have, to experiment. Yeah. Right. I, did it, I did it once by accident because I was like multitasking. Oh, okay. You, and missed, I, you missed it? I missed it. And there's this like really subtle audio cue there that, is. There, that a choice yeah. is happening, but right. it's pretty subtle. The other... Um, the other non again this is non spoilers other kind of uh, functional description I'll describe is mm-hmm. that you know if you if you use the analogy of a choose your own adventure book we've talked about how we love reading these old books where you can the way I people read them all sorts of different ways you could read them over and over again right and and maybe take a notepad and write down your choices mm-hmm. uh, I use the uh, thumbing the page method yep. where I my goal actually as I said before I like reading all the reaching all the short endings 
and then eventually ending up with the longest. You would aim ending. for the short endings? Yeah, to get them out of the way. To get them out of the way. So okay. that I won't have to actually reread the whole book huh. again. I would, I would want to, if you think of the flow chart, I want to reach the short branches so I can climb back up. It's so technical and of then, you. And then go. Don't you want to get into the immerse yourself and believe that you are the protagonist and what would you do? I, 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 I would do that you're too. You're gaming the system. I don't like, like that. It's like taking the SATs. I know the way these books are they're written. I kind of have a sense of what the the easy and you know the, the more okay. difficult and the I, short and long. Well, I'll be curious I, to find out if you were successful doing that. Well, the functional description I'll t- say about this show is that because it's a TV show, because it's you know FMV essentially, uh, you can't thumb the pages, you can't bookmark. There's no back and, and there's forth, no, and there's no going back. There's either. no chapter. There's no timeline like a uh, scroll bar. That's exactly it. You can't scroll back and and replay episodes. Uh, replace scenes. You can jump, I think, 10 seconds backward. In the scene that you're in. In the scene you're in. To the last bookmark, yeah. Yes. Uh, but when you reach an ending, it automatically gives you the option to jump back to the last choice you made. Sometimes. Sometimes. So <clears throat> not when you... Are we getting into spoilers? No, 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 no. That no. does not happen if you reach one of the five endings. Then then you're done. Isn't there more than five endings? Netflix says there are five endings. Uh I believe at several points as you're watching this, if you reach an ending where they feel like a large percentage of people will reach that ending soon yeah. or have made that choice and is an ending, they'll give you a prompt to to go back and make another choice. Mm-hmm. So you don't have to start the episode over. Right. Just as a functional thing, I think that's a smart way to- That happened to me, by the way. Allow you to watch you know, what essentially could be as short as a 40-minute episode yeah. and get 90 or 120 minutes out I, I agree with you. I'll talk about the experience when we get to spoilers because so, that happened to me. Is there any other? Uh, how about? Uh, did you like it? I mean, it's well. We can say this without really spoiling anything. It's it's set in the eighties, so it has that kind of nostalgia kind of component to it that is all the rage. Mm-hmm. Jeremy, yeah, well, and we can I'm say the you. premise is a the protagonist is a, a coder coding a video game, and. I think that's really all we can say about <laughs> without going to spoilers. It wasn't terribly it, like I would also say it's not as dark as some of the other Black Mirror episodes. It gets a little. I mean, it's definitely not for kids. Okay, all that I think kind it of depends stuff. what choices you make. It's, it's not really? for kids for sure. It's yeah. not for kids. No, some of the other Black Mirror episodes are dark. Yeah, yeah. yeah not okay. only Black Mirror. Any Black Mirror is for kids. Mm-hmm. There's not a single episode of Black Mirror that I would show. I thought USS Callister was attend. amazingly uplifting, and it's still not for kids. No, no, yeah. it's, it gets pretty dark. Uh, I will say I thought the premise, the idea was novel, and I will acknowledge that Steven Soderbergh did something very similar on a HBO, I believe, called Mosaic uh, last year hmm. so, or a year ago, even before. So Same kind of interactive. Same kind of interactive thing. Huh. So this is not new. The fact that it's on Netflix and it's a very popular franchise. Um, it, also that it's digital, so you have much more. Like, I think how seamless they made it and well, it's, the fact that it plays on so many platforms And anyone now. who played PC games, CD-ROM games <laughs> yeah. in the late 90s, you know, we had plenty of these FMV, choose-your-own-adventure type games, yeah. right? The, the promise, the premise here was that it would somehow really leverage the Black Mirror aspect of it. And I think it fell short of that. I think that um, the the gimmick kind of, uh, the gimmick took over and overwhelmed the story and it wasn't as satisfying a story as I thought it could have been. All right, hit the red light, then we can uh, talk about this. Okay. Well, uh, well Jeremy. Uh, I, just speaking technically, uh, this made me want more technically. Like I really, and it, it, they're not all binary choices, so they clearly have the choice of having more options on That's the screen. That's a very good non-spoiler th- thing to mention, yeah. And I also, and I I, it made me think, well, what if they had my, if I can incorporate my phone number into the game and I could get text messages or somehow interact with the program via the internet in other ways? Uh, and maybe that's that gets too complicated and no one's going to give the time in order to actually engage with that to that level. But I felt like just the choose your own adventure on screen was maybe the tip of the iceberg in terms of what you could do with interactive programming. It, yeah, it reminded me of, of it, that game that came out in the early noughts, uh, where it would text you and email you. The and, majestic. Yeah, very good memory. Yeah, yeah, and it was. Uh, well, then, then you're talking about. Uh, sorry, you're talking about Ares. 
Sure. And you go and you surf the internet, you find these hidden websites, and you, oh, ARG, you, you engage in different ways. I think there's a potential for more than just a, a sit down and you know choose your own adventure. And program. while you and I would love that, and there were elements of this where if people wanted a deep dive, they could find hidden websites yeah. and, and find that ARG aspect to it, the alternate reality game mm -hmm. aspect to it. I think they really want to hit that sweet spot of zeitgeist and mainstream, you know, of uh, 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 mass appeal. Um, I enjoyed it though. I, th I think what they did was successful. It just made me want, maybe, it made me think about what you could do with more. I think narratively it was unsatisfying, which is, I think, if you're going to, my, kind of my, uh, my test for this was, I, I, what I hoped for was that the endings and the story would diverge enough uh -huh. that there would be very different endings. Right. And that it, the challenge as a writer for then the producers, the challenge of creating the show would, would be to create a satisfying narrative with every one of the endings. So you wouldn't feel like there was a best ending. Well, or you feel like an ending was a cut short and a wrong choice. I think what you really want in that case is Wing Commander, where every choice splits, it mm -hmm. bifurcates, and you have those are in, like continue, and, and then they have choices, and the only way to reach every point is it's a redo it. is to do the, those specific chain of choices, and, and then meet that challenge, the writing challenge of telling actually a compelling and satisfactory story that may be wildly different right. than one other choice because you're really just on a completely different path. At that point, you're making five different TV shows. Right. Here, it really just felt like they're spinning the wheels a lot on the same theme. With there the, is too many over choices. and over again. With these, you ha you make about thirty choices potentially if you play along, if you watch a long version of the, of the of Bandersnatch. Not if you made my choices. <laughs> you can make many, like I, literally thirty or so, but you always end up at five of these endings. Yeah. So it really, I mean. It's a lot, whole lot of work. I completely understand. Yeah. That that's like, uh, from a production standpoint, they already filmed five hours for this. To do what I'm talking about would be uh, order of magnitude yeah. more. But that's in my head what I kind of Yeah, I'm wanted. with you on that. Um, okay, so red light? So, so yeah, let's let's switch on the red light. Oh, and one other thing, smart move on Netflix to for piracy, right? Because pirates I can't, like, what are you going to do? Download all five episodes, five hours? Yeah. And then they, watch in a row? They will. You know they're going, like somebody's going to put together. You lose together. the experience. Yeah, um, no doubt. All right, so if you're watching the video, the light behind Kishore turned red, and it's going to stay red while we talk about spoilers on Bandersnatch. If you're just listening to the audio, go back, look at the description on iTunes, on Pocket Cast, wherever you've downloaded this episode, and find the timestamp in the description that will skip you ahead to post-spoiler talk. So here we go. Okay. Jeremy, Yeah. let's kick things off. Uh, okay, so I was very surprised at my first run through. How I, many run throughs did you do? I, but, I tried to get up to all the endings and oh. I, I didn't know there were only five. Like I just kept watching it until I felt like I must have hit them all and I hit four. There was one ending I did not hit, which is when you try to walk out the window when you're yeah, in the, jump the window in the, in the, ther the therapist, psychiatrist's yes, office. As opposed to fighting. And what? It, and it turns out that you're on a set. Now they, you, they, it, they showed that you were on a set in another ending, so I had already gotten the gist of that, but I didn't. Oh, see what now? That's I've not gotten to this. <laughs> hey, oh, what's going you're, on? You're in spoiler territory, man. <laughs> Holy crap! So, I mean, the thing we'll acknowledge, and hopefully you out there have watched or at least experienced Banner Snatch. The thing I was most surprised with is that they tied the choose your own adventure mechanic into the story. They made that part of the story. The story was about a choose your own adventure, well, game. You, book you as the, in the viewer, format of a choose your own adventure. You as the viewer become an active right, right. And even before we're talking about just the premise of the the narrative they wrote, right, mm. it wasn't just about a guy writing a video game. Right, it was about a guy writing a video, a choose your own adventure video game. Exactly. And based on a choose your own adventure book. So already thematically, they linked the way they told the story with what the story was with, about with the medium. Yeah, which yeah. I think is a very Black Mirror thing for them to do. I thought that was really smart. I mean, it was very self-aware and I think that it works. And that self-awareness, I think, made some of those choices. And we're gonna, there is a, if you haven't reached this option, sorry, but there is a choice where you you directly, quote unquote, interact with the protagonist, with Stefan. Stefan. He talks to you. Because he becomes aware that someone is controlling his actions. Yeah. What? And you tell mm -hmm. him that. <laughs> Sorry, you buddy. tell him. And he, he yells out into the sky. Who's doing this? This was one of my favorite parts. Because at this point, you you then, there's multiple options. And um, you tell options. him. Yeah. When you get to this point, depending on the thread you've taken, right. you get different choices. It's three choices. It's yeah, exactly. Either, oh, it's, a three choice thing. It's either well, the no, icon. No, it's, it's only two at a time. Yeah. Oh, okay. But it's either the, the icon, 
which is the, the, the glyph, choo- the, glyph the, the glyph of the choose the, 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 the wishbone. Yeah, the fork. Um, the fork in, in the flow chart, uh, which you can choose, which leads one path. Or you can choose, it says Netflix. It's the Netflix logo. And so so when, if you choose that, you, what it happens is on the screen, like Matrix, this is, you know, the Matrix has you Neo style. It'll type out to him, I'm watching this on Netflix. <laughs> And then he says, "That's what, hilarious." He says, "What is Netflix?" And the options are, "Try to explain." Yeah. Or end the conversation. If you try to explain, goes, "Well, it's a streaming service." What a weird. And so at some point, wall. he tells you, "I'm being controlled by my friend in the future." Yeah. <laughs> On Netflix, and I was like, "Oh, this is like too self indulgent." I thought that was just too much. No, I because they didn't lean into enough. It became a short ending. It, it was a short ending. You're right. You're it, right. There, it, that was like a dead end ending, a novelty dead end ending. That while funny, See, I think that it's they didn't I they, think they lo- either didn't lean into that, that enough. That fulfilled the whole idea of this show for me. Like mm. it, the fact that it wrapped back around to me being in the future, like actually being an active participant in the story, it worked for me and, and it made me laugh. It was the, probably the only time I laughed watching the whole show. But then at the and end, I, so I appreciated that it didn't have a satisfactory. It didn't go deeper into what that meant. But that's how choose like, your own adventure books work. No, that's there's true. always a novelty ending like somewhere. It was a novelty ending. But I, at that point I was like, okay, is this whole episode now going to be about this character's relationship with someone in an alternate reality watching him and controlling him and the nature of that relationship? I wanted that further explored. And it just became this gimmicky, let's do a martial arts crazy fight ending or the the fourth wall breaking, I'm on a movie set ending. Yes. Yes, there there is another ending where it's it gets Netflixy as well because there's uh, the the protagonist goes to jail and or does he die? I forget what happens. So in any, there uh, at some of these endings, they you, they show the credits and the way they show the credits actually is different depending on the ending you get because those credits are fake credits and I think that's what you're alluding to, right? One of the endings, the longest ending, which some people credit as this is the the quote unquote the the long ending uh-huh. is the one where you reach the end, the game gets reviewed, it's bad, you get the credits, and there's a post credit scene where the daughter of one of the characters, daughter of Colin, daughter of the programmer, becomes a programmer herself and picks on this curse of a choose your own adventure and makes ostensibly the the Netflix show you are watching currently. Oh, and, that's cool. And then you control her. And then you make her either destroy her computer or throw coffee on it. Isn't it tea? Yeah, sorry, tea. tea. Yeah. Yeah. So, and and nice, that's the nice. ending of the episode. <laughs> yeah. I got to that part. I did like the com- the, the reviews because that let you know. It that gave me ending. a sense of like, did I win or not? So at the all, at oh. all of the endings, the game Bandersnatch is reviewed by this guy. Like It looks like Computer Chronicles on PBS yeah. or something. Right. Where, it's young Will Smith. Yes. Where some, somebody's young on, Gary Wood. Let's go young, young Gary Wood. Somebody's on television and they they review Bandersnatch and it either gets zero out of five stars or maybe, I got that one. Maybe like two and a half or it can't. I got get, both of those. It actually. can get a five star rating and I, and I felt like that was the win. I felt like, that, oh. like I'd won the game because Bandersnatch got five star. Well, rating. see, then then you're playing, you're watching the episode as if it's a game. A game yeah, exactly. As opposed to watching it as a narrative, because I found none of those satisfactory. And the only ending I found narratively satisfactory was the one where he quote unquote goes back in time and chooses to go with his mother on the train. That was freaking freaky, man. And and then you know dies in the therapist chair. And I feel like that was the most Black Mirror. Why narrative. dying in the therapist chair? That did not satisfy me at all. That made no sense. Because he had gone back in his mind. He had, he had his his mind went Why would back. he die? I don't know. It's because, Black Mirror. Because it's Black <laughs> Mirror. <laughs> not and, and, and mirrors were mirrors are forms of time travel, says Colin under the influence of mushrooms, LSD. LSD. That was not a mushroom. Um See, was, I haven't I haven't done all these bridges, so it's a little I'm surprised that you didn't get those prompts at the end of the episode to go back cuz I only technically watched it through one and a half times. Did you drop acid with so, Colin? No, I didn't no. get there. I <laughs> I did the um I accepted the offer at the video game place. Okay. Which is the choice that everyone does first. Yeah. No, and everyone, I I'm sorry. didn't. I didn't. Oh, you did, so you missed that. I was so happy with myself and so surprised because the entire time after that making that choice where I decided to not take the offer. Yeah. I was saying, man, what happens if you take? What the, happens if you take the offer? And, and it's a dead end. You're clearly supposed to take the offer. I was thinking. See, this is this is my problem with this this uh, this format and the limitations they had with this production is that in my world, those two choices would be full branching. 
Yeah, I thought right? they. Were, I thought they were. I and, thought it was. And a so full you and, and you would be, and then then at the end you're like I amped up. Now I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna choose yes the opera and get another hour and a half exactly. of awesome <laughs> entertainment. <laughs> yeah. And it's just a dead end because you thumbed the wrong place in the book. That ends the whole story. Like it does, that choice right there. Yeah, but and it I, was cool how it rewound. It, like fast forward the story. Mm-hmm. Yes, so you when can they get back again. to the yeah. that choice pretty quickly. I and mean, that's why I, I say I, so I want to. I want to reach the short endings first. Are there many of those moments though? The the rest of the way, the I didn't get endings? a sense. No, I got the sense that first, like except destroying for a the fuse, computer is was, a short ending. What, no, but I got the sense that that like fast forward through stuff to get you back to stuff. That was really just showing you the mechanics of how this is going to work. Hmm. No, and that I, was like an education. I tool. think the other one is follow Colin or oh, go yeah. into the therapist's office. Well, I think that the, um, the those whole, are two big diverging paths. Didn't it start when you like shouted at, at the dad? I feel like that was a big break. Yeah. I, I mean, regardless, uh, that was the only one in the beginning. The accept or deny was the only one where as you went back, the the content changed. Where Colin says, I, he, he actually feels like he's done this before. So a, oh, like when he meets yeah. Colin for the first time? Yeah. And they say, he, I've he, met you yeah. before. I've met you before. And that, I, I know about this game. You're right. And I want. I thought that was interesting. So it, it affected the, the, the replay. replay. And I wanted that to be more present yeah. in the That's later really hard replays. to do, though. That's, I know. It's, Absolutely. It's logistically, yeah. it's, it's so tough. See, I only got to the ending that, I, uh, that I, I sort of quit at was I got a two and a half star after taking pills from the, from the therapist. Oh wow! Have, Have you, you taken you the, took pills? the pills? See, when you I take first... the pills and it like fast forwards you into the future, yeah, yeah. I and did... you're at like Christmas time. On a subsequent yeah. playthrough, I took the pills, but on my first playthrough, I could only throw them away or flush them. Oh, what? Yeah, interesting. Huh. So, my th- my theory though is that uh, there's a secret ending that we have not resolved yet. Because like, I feel only like if there's... you listen to the Thompson Twins. I don't know, man. <laughs> my my feeling. You, know, you did maybe to maybe this is wishful Twins thinking. I did. You of didn't listen it. to now too, did you? No, I did now too. Who listens to now too? I did now too. <laughs> what? I did now too. <laughs> so, I feel like narratively, what it was going for, and the path they were drawing for, forward was this whole Pax thing, the um, uh, well, something in control, right? Um, uh, PACS. Yeah, program. Program and control yeah. system. Uh, or PAX, right? PAX and PAX. Mm-hmm. The, the demon in the game was PAX and program control. And you get to a point where you realize the dad is spying on you and uh, you're supposed to call the therapist. And this is an uh, interesting choice because this is one of the few times where you don't have just a left or right choice. Here you actually have to type in numbers. And they telegraph to you this voiceover of like the five numbers. The therapist has kind of, as, as as you've done the playthroughs, the therapist has whispered to you or... or put in your subconsciousness and you type it in and you call the therapist's office and you don't get the therapist. You get the receptionist yeah. and it's a very generic ending where the receptionist says, no, no there, appointments available. No appointment. <laughs> yeah. She's not available. And then the, and then you, or not you, the, the uh, Stefan goes, uh, oh, I killed my dad. And, and then it ends essentially. You, you threaten to kill her too. Right. You threaten yeah. her and it basically ends there. And my feeling is that, that is an opportunity where there is a five-digit combination. Now, all we need out there are 100,000 people, 999,999 mm-hmm. 000, people to try a different combination and find that secret ending. Because I feel like okay. that pushes you to the logical end of a PAX storyline. Because I don't think we felt like we understood what PAX was or the purpose of PAX. Like, this... He shows up in a few nightmarish sequences. It's a jump scare, the demon itself. Yeah. Yeah, in, in Colin's apartment. But I feel like there's a deeper, like there's more story yeah. there. Well, there is that one secret uh, ending that has surfaced online. And you linked to a tweet of it uh, where there's a sequence of events you can take that gets you to the very end of one of the endings, uh, post credits, where Colin goes back to the scene where he puts the tape in his Walkman. In the beginning, he's seeing the bus ride. But instead of the Thompson Twins or Now too, you pop in the Bandersnatch soundtrack. Yes. And it plays an annoying sound. Like a modem dial-up sound. Well, if I had heard, if I had heard this, I would have known that wasn't, and you would have known that's not I a know it's dial-up not. sound. Yes. What it is is the, what is the audio of a uh, Spectrum program that's on an audio cassette. Which you can then... Ba- back in the day, you could load programs onto your computer 
either with a floppy disk or with audio cassettes. And so you'd pop in the audio cassette, connect it to the computer, and then hit play and load on the computer. And the computer would listen to the sound and turn it into data. And that sound is one of these programs. This is like a. Is it the whole program? Th- or this is, is just like an like iPhone 5 QR code kind of thing. It, it is a whole program that displays a QR code. Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. So if you run it on a Spectrum emulator, it will show a, a glitchy QR code on the screen. If I you, love the analog digital. If you go to that website, or if you go, uh, scan the code, you go to a website, which is a secret uh, website where you download the uh, the game that he's, dive. that he's playing in the when he first meets Colin. Which Nosedive is also another allusion to a previous uh, Black, Mirror, Black Mirror episode, the one with um, ooh, uh, Bryce Dallas Howard about and, points. And Nosedive is what the, is he the does. challenge that Colin or you have to do in, yeah. later in, the, in Bandersnatch. Which jumping thought, off the roof that was awesome. or jumping off the side of the building. But uh, the programmer for that Spectrum game said that he did produce one other piece of Spectrum content that has not surfaced yet. What? There you go. So maybe you're right. There you go. I think there's more to it. I think there's a long game. I hope, maybe it's really wishful thinking. You can go to the Reddit threads on black r slash black mirror and there's Look, there's a flow charts. You can you can, you can see all the flow charts. This isn't as satisfying as an episode as USS Callister from story wise. There's no doubt. It's not as satisfying as the dog episode. The novelty of this. Yeah. Like, I mean... Forget whether it was great or not. It was entertaining as hell. Wouldn't you love to see the metrics on this from Netflix's side? Like how much engagement there is? Yeah, but I'd feel sad because it would be like, and Taylor Swift did 8 million times more. (laughs) (laughs) I wonder how many people do one playthrough and how many people... I think it could be frustrating for people that were you know, coming home from work and just turning on Netflix. I think this would be a little frustrating. Not yeah. expecting the interaction, right. yeah, because it's not, yeah, people. Well, want you can like you can play it without the interaction, and it just randomly chooses the choices. And theoretically, it still works as a narrative because the illusion, the the appearance of choice, mm-hmm. is tied into the theme of the episode. And so you could watch this without actually interacting, and the pop ups, even if you go down that Netflix route, the the Netflix option <laughs> becomes a, a story. It could be a really short story, yeah. Or unsatisfactory story, but it is one of the stories. Oh yeah, I made the wrong phone call once. Well, you typed the wrong numbers. Yeah, yeah, and it it just you know I also did your phone ring. (laughs) That'd be great. (laughs) I wish that they hadn't given you the answer. That's why I think it's a it's a misdirection. I wish that they had just let you go back and say, "Well, wait a minute." Right. There's a number, and then watch the episode and listen for the number. Because the therapist at some point says you can. Colin does. No, no. She, I think she says you can watch things, you can relive things again, and it, it, things are different. Oh, okay. But Colin says if you listen, the yeah. numbers are right. In the world is code or something, and yeah. you listen for the numbers. There's a lot in his monologue. Yeah. Uh, and they talked about his in the when his when his game bugged out when he was playing it. It bugged out because of a mem- like a memory overflow because the eyes popped out. The the the, uh, his, the eyeball graphic caused a memory overflow over buffer overflow or something. Okay, and that's what caused that glitch to happen. And then when they're tripping on acid, his, his eyes, his are, eyes are popping out. out. That yeah. was really creepy. Yeah, it's creepy. It's it's fun. <laughs> it was fun. I just didn't think it was very satisfying. Um, but I, I really admire the effort, and we're talking about it. All right, spoiler time is over. Banner snatch time is over. We're gonna move on to our next segment. In just like five seconds, once Jeremy turns off the light and uh, plays the episode. It, it's not red, at least. There it goes. Is that good? There, that's perfect. That's good. There we go. All right. That was fun. You, speak- al- you alluded to this being a big Netflix period. Yes. And I want to highlight something I watched on Netflix that was gripping. Oh. It was called The Bodyguard. Oh, not what I want to talk about. Oh, you want to talk about Bird Box? Yeah. Well, we'll get to Bird Box too. The Bodyguard was insane. It like is a six episode series based out of the UK. And it's literally following a bodyguard for like a a cabinet level person. Mm -hmm. It's not a remake of the Whitney Houston, Kevin Costner movie. Oh, thank goodness. No, it is fictional. 
It is fictional. Okay. It is the most intense thing I've I've watched on Netflix just ever. Really? Is 10 minutes in, you're basically on the edge of your seat. It's only six episodes long, and I'm still shook. Hour-long episodes? Yeah, they're about an hour, oh, a little more. That's a commitment. It is, it is unbelievably arresting uh, about how uh, tense and wow. intense this is. Okay. It, is, it was awesome. Is I it, highly, highly recommend it. Is it for, it. for kids? <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> all right. And it, it just like constant, it like twists and turns, but it's not trying to trick you per se. Um, I like it. It was very tense. Do right. not you watch it. No, no, I, I like the idea. That's not trying to trick. Don't me. watch this if you're looking for a relaxing night at home, because you will have to start binging it. Relatively speaking, I'm sure it's going to be relaxing for me. <laughs> I don't know. Thanks for the recommendation. Six episodes of The Bodyguard. The other thing that dropped on Netflix and huge, interesting phenomenon is Bird Box, mm-hmm. the see no evil uh, part of the, uh, the horror unrelated series of movies because we had uh, in 2018 of course a quiet place uh which I hope you guys have watched it's fantastic no nope oh, didn't one see of it the best movies of the year so good uh but that's um, the one with jim halpert yes All right. and, and mary poppins <laughs> and their kids <laughs> well not the real kids but uh the, the monster that you can't make a sound that movie you can't make a sound um this movie you can't see the monster. Bird Box. Med- now, like Medusa. 45 million accounts watch this. This is the first time Netflix has released these kind of numbers, and it's kind of staggering. Netflix, of course, is globally, not just in the U.S. But Netflix said 45 million accounts watch Bird Box. Anyone who does internet analytics or makes videos on the internet can take a step back like wait a minute what does that actually mean right 45 million accounts how many people is that were people there were these people who just started and maybe didn't finish and netflix clarified they said these are individual accounts not people and there's people who played bird box and watched 80 percent, at least 80 percent of the film how do you quit this I, and movie right. like at First, 80%. I, I want to know who are the people who watch 80 percent and then stop maybe they couldn't get to the the climax of it i don't know too much for them but that's a, I mean, they must have ch- looked at like the the retention rate yeah. of this film and chose the point at which people dipped, and then just like that's that's the number. They're yeah. waiting for the choices to pop up, and they're like, "What?" It's it, 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 presumably it. way more people started, like fifty million people started, or you know, yeah. sixty million, but only forty five. So they got to the place before it was a big dip, and they said that's a really good number, forty five million, Whatever. and that's accounts. So people share accounts, people watch movies together. This is like. You're saying there's more that that watched it. <clears throat> you know, it may be it may be fifty percent more. Who knows? Not Did you. you like it? I didn't watch it. Oh, <laughs> I'm not one of the forty five. After million. all of that, but my, the point is that if this was released in theaters, that would have been at average price of ten dollars a ticket. That would have been at least almost half a billion dollars at the box office, mm-hmm. and it shows the the reach of Netflix and the convenience of being able to watch a blockbuster movie, which in any other year, five years ago, would have been put on the big screen. And for people who for people behind the scenes making that movie, are they satisfied with that? Are they happy that this movie was watched by a ton of people? Or would they wish that they would have potentially made more money and maybe spent different marketing efforts on this by releasing it in a more traditional way? Uh, so I watched it. It's good. It's It's in that vein of I'm sure what a quiet, I didn't watch A Quiet Place, but in that sort of suspenseful thriller, kind of, you know, not quite horror, it's not as good as like a get out because it's lacking the next level commentary mm-hmm. that a get out brought to the, to the table, but it's good. What is important to me about this is if you watched Bright, uh, if you watched uh, which is that Will Smith one, which was kind of disappointing. David Ayers. If you watched that rom com with like Lucy Liu and uh, what's his face, I don't Tay even Diggs. Know what that was. Um, that are you was talking about Netflix originals. Yeah, these are if, all. Netflix. If you're watching about if you if you're watching the Cloverfield Paradox, I mean these are all not great. Great. This yeah. is the first one that I've watched that is like a Netflix produced movie that has been good. That like is like a theatrical type movie. I, I would say Ballad of Buster Scruggs. I didn't watch that. Uh, what the hell is that? That's it's the Coen Brothers movie. Oh, it's about a golfer. Sounds no, like it's Legend a, it's a of Western. Vance. It's a, it's a Western. 
Uh, that to me was the the tipping point for Netflix. But the point is, regardless of what your flavor and what your taste in movies are, like Netflix is now not just buying films, but self-producing films that I would pay. I would have paid good money to watch in theaters. I would have left the house to go see. <laughs> That's it. saying a lot. Now, I I think you're kind of looking back hindsight, like 2020 hindsight, right? It's not fair. Yeah. On the other end, also, I think creative people, on some level, they just want their stuff seen. It's not about the money for everybody. Like, obviously, it's important, and on, ev- for everybody, it is important. And on some level, for uh, above the you know uh, above the line producers or whatever, they care about success, and, and then maybe they care more awards at some point. Exactly. And after you have a success like this, you have a lot more power going into your next project. Right. Right. Uh, but here, I think the power really is on Netflix side. Hmm. It's on Netflix and showing how they can release something and get way more people in their seats to watch this thing and this is the lure other producers other actors to their platform Sandra Bullock was really good in this by the way and so I think that's the other advantage here is that if there's still like skeptical actors actresses I think that starts to break all of that down is that Sandra Bullock with the yeah huh, how about that yeah it's not one of the kids it's not John Malkovich He's in the film too. Uh, he is. He is in the film. Oh wow! I mean, it, it's a blockbuster film. Um, speaking of blockbusters, I did leave the house once this holiday break to watch a movie, and it was, unfortunately wasn't to watch Into the Spider Verse again, which mm-hmm. I kind of wish I did yeah, as my, well. Peter, my son wants to, but I saw Aquaman. All right, did you see it? Nope. All right, I didn't oh. see it. So I can't talk about it. No spoilers. I will say whatever. It's, a movie. it's Aquaman. It's a like, movie that deserves to. Uh, be seen on the big screen. If you're gonna watch it once, it really it makes the most out of the the large format screen. Don't see it in 3D. I hated it in 3D. Then um, it's just uh, like sharks and whales swimming at well, you. Well, and also like the the 3D I saw in IMAX had some polarization problems where like there's a lot of red, like punchy red from the hair of Mara to uh, Black you, Manta's eye. Were you watching with anaglyph glasses? No, it was the IMAX polarized glasses. Okay. But one of the lenses muted the reds and the other popped out the reds and combined, it made the red color look really shimmery. Mm. And, I, and I didn't like that at all. Um, but James Wan, who directed, I believe, Fast 7, uh, directed this one and uh, he knows how to direct an action movie. And they threw it all on the screen. If they had not they basically put all their ideas for an Aquaman movie on the table and and then did it all and spent the money and blew it out and it was kind of worth it. What do you think of the costumes? Because I love like, the cost. I the love mirror Aquaman. costume looks great and the uh there's one character that I've seen the costume for that I don't think was revealed like a villain. I thought that costume looked good. You are talking about uh Manta or Yeah, Orm? Manta. Manta I I I think that if we look at where we were 10 years ago with Iron Man 1 and the movie's trying to be grounded in realism and being impressed by how quote unquote uh, comic realistic or comic accurate the Iron Man costume was costume designers can go fr- have just like free reign now they don't care how realistic Black Manta if you haven't seen the character is a dude in a black suit of armor and his head is like a flying saucer it looks comical but it works they they even write into the story why his head why that helmet is so big and it's he's menacing, uh, and I I love the costume design I think Aquaman's gold costume at the very end of the film I think it looked fantastic, uh, and the writing is terrible. There's problems. There's all sorts of problems with the script and all sorts of just problems with the story. Uh, but hey, it's a fresh it, tomato. It's it's a fresh tomato. Sixty four percent. It's not the dark DC though. It no, sounds like no, this no. is much more campy. Totally, it's it's way way more fun and and totally even totally it's all over the place. There's like scary moments, little campy, lighthearted moments. Yeah. There's world traveling. It's it's very globe trotting. Is Wonder uh, Woman in it? Wonder Woman. Is, there's no basically no connection. There's one brief mention of what happened in Justice League, but there's no connection. Is there a post credit? Uh, there is a post credit scene. Is and, Superman alive? Not mentioned. Okay. No other DC universe thing mentioned. But it is like if you watch this movie, it's it's like a combination of every other block. It's like let's take the twenty most bombastic blockbusters mm-hmm. that come out in the past fifteen years and put it all in one movie. Okay. Lord of the Rings, Tron, it's all there. Legacy. How long is it? Uh, so, a little long. over two, hour, two hours. 
Are you still excited for Wonder Woman 84? Oh, yeah. All right. They finished filming that. Okay. It has wrapped filming, and I'm excited for anything that Patty Jenkins is doing now. She's a, doing a, uh, she just directed a uh, miniseries called I Am the Night um, with Chris Pine, and it's going to air on TNT, and I'm looking forward to that as well. Uh, this summer, mm-hmm. the thing maybe you're most excited for, Jeremy... Aren't, aren't we all excited about this? We're very excited about it. Fourth of July. This is a summer release. What's Stran- with this? Stranger Things season three. The third. They announced it at midnight on New Year's Day. Now, is this the final season? Why would that be? Have they announced that when, like, when this whole show is going to end? Not that I know of. Why would why would why would they stop? I think they need to stop at some point. But they're it's so popular and they're making money. That's not how. That's I, I that's think not, Daredevil was still. That's popular. not how Seinfeld works. Yeah, they, Th- that's television twenty years ago though. No, no, but Seinfeld stopped it when he was at the peak. You're saying they should stop when they're hot. Yeah, yeah, well, and, and have a, a logical conclusion. I don't know to the whole adventure. I think they should keep going until they're in the nineties. Mm, they... Same kids, <laughs> just keep, just keep. I it mean, going. I'm excited that it's the summer. Isn't it eighty five in the yeah. universe? Sounds because. Right. A little movie called Back to the Future came out. Yep. So I'm hoping a DeLorean shows up. I was alive in this era. Why the 4th of July, do you think? Well, they're changing up the release time so that uh, it's about summer break as opposed to about going mm. back to school because okay. the first two seasons were in the fall. You know, Halloween being yep. very thematically appropriate with summer camp and 4th of July celebrations. A lot of like confusion and chaos and yeah. activity. It's perfect for a small town. Well, I like the teacher, though. I like the science teacher. I'll miss him. Okay, I'm excited. Fourth of July. Is there anything you deciphered from the poster? No. Is there a code? I Hid- don't know. Hidden in the fireworks? No, it seems like something you might have been looking for. Duffer no. Brothers have not said how many seasons they're going to do. I feel like let's end it at four. What's wrong with you? It, they got to move on to other things. Spin off. Spin it off. And conclude the story. Uh, when these kids graduate from I like- school... What, 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 I think the only lingering thing is the whole like other 11s, like the other kids. Right. Yeah. I it's, think that's their, that's the thing they can. There's a real the spin-off, spin-off potential there. There. I don't know. I, I say keep going until it gets bad. <laughs> no, stop. that's not and a way stop. to do it. No, no. You want to end on the but high then, note. But then you know you got all the good that you could. Like you don't know that. Maybe there's another season of Seinfeld out there that you never got. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. There was another season in Seinfeld that we never got. It was on Curb Your Enthusiasm. Yeah. And it was, a, it was a meta story. And it was totally satisfactory. It was pretty amazing. Yeah. Uh, before we um, uh, wrapped up last year, we talked about probably the biggest viral hit of at the end of 2018, which was the Glitter Bomb. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we talked about how it, a local a local guy you know. Yeah, Mark Rober. He set up a – he had a package stolen. And the police did nothing about it. So he planted a – package out in front of his house that he constructed to spew glitter when opened and spray fart spray and record the whole thing on four cell phones and upload it to the internet. And there must have been five or six different criminals who stole this package and he had the footage from everybody and he released it to the internet. It turns out that he had some help uh, with the project and his assistant told his friends, a couple friends of his assistant about this package, and his friends, friends, took the package. So in the video, he said after he did the first test, you know, live test, and retrieved the package, he handed the package off, this this uh, this dummy package off to a friend. He says it in the video. My friend, Cece, or something, had, had also had her packages stolen, and so I let her borrow this for a couple of days, and it turns out that what he had to acknowledge was that he gave... Uh, some financial incentives for his friends to retrieve the package, back. which is which is fine. Which he is fine. gave them money, for, paid for their time. Exactly. This and is they, he didn't pay to have these faked, and but his friends burned him, and wanted the easy way out of getting that that incentive, and then stage package uh, detonations and retrievals. Yep. So and when he found out about it. He edited the video, took that out, put in a, dis- uh, a note in the description, and then released a note on Twitter. And it was it was awesome what he, he said. He had totally owned it. Yep. He owned the mi- took responsibility for it, acknowledged the mistake. Um, and, and I think he also owned the fact, and you, you could see this in the video, that he's not comfortable with these kind of videos, these like 
quote unquote prank videos. And this is why, because he's like really an educator. He's like a, you know, he's a, a, a science communicator YouTuber more than anything else. And this whole idea of relying on other people and in, in, in this kind of way, uh, put him out of his comfort zone. Yeah. I'm a, a, a bad situation and I feel bad for him. It sucks. I mean, he did absolutely the right thing and, and he owned up to it. The, huge props to him. Uh, it just sucks because now the headline and now what people are spreading around is that the whole thing was fake and not understanding that only parts of it were staged, but beyond his control. Mm hmm. It's too bad. I mean, the whole point of the video to me is not the, is not the, um, uh, the actual like comeuppance. It's the engineering of that thing still for, for you and me. Yeah. I think a lot of people watched for Uh, the comeuppance. That's definitely why people watch, but the engineering of that thing is, is what I won't forget. Yeah. Uh, it's 2019. We are. It is the year. The year. We finally made it. The hey, tested Adam well, Savage here. So what what's, what's going what on, Jerry? What's going Jerry's on? Jerry's just surfing <laughs> the internet while we're doing this podcast. <laughs> it, what? It, what is this? Why? Sorry, oh, I you, put in the wrong, the link. wrong video. Okay. 2019, the year that Galaxy's Edge will open its doors. The so, Galaxy will open its doors this what, year. R- so I remind say, me, what is Galaxy's Edge? Gal- Star Wars Land. Thank you. Star Wars Land at Disneyland. I've made a huge mistake. So this year, I'm taking my son over spring break to Disney World. He doesn't know about this. Don't watch this podcast. Uh, and I'm like a few months too early. But this, that's Disney World. This is at both. Yeah, we're yeah. going to both this year. We're going <laughs> in... in February to land and oh wow, wow you're gonna miss spring it. break. You don't want to be there when this opens. Is it really? Is it gonna it's be that? It's gonna bad? be the. You do, but you don't want to go to Galaxy's Edge. You want to go everywhere else. That's true. Ah, that's yeah. that's true. Totally <laughs> uh, that, true. Now is the time. To that's go to a Cars Disney land. World wisdom just <laughs> dropped upon you. <laughs> because it's gonna be nuts, and they're finally showing uh, a little more about what the attractions will be like. We all expect there to be a Millennium Falcon ride. You're going to be in the cockpit of Millennium Falcon. Now you actually have shots. Uh, Disney released some behind-the-scenes interviews and footage from the the uh, the whole land being built, and you have a shot of what looks like six people in the cockpit of the Millennium Falcon. Not a lot of people. I don't know how they're going to do that like, turnover. Just, you're just going to wait in line just all a, day just for that a, one ride. There's going to be a ton of cockpits of it. But it seems like everybody has a role to play. Right, interactive. Yeah. They'll, they'll Gunner, be, pilot, yeah. Which is a very Disney World thing. Button pusher. Button pusher, yeah. Uh, what, what's a Mission Earth, right? Mission Mission Space. Sorry, Mission Space, The uh, is that what it is? In Disney World, have you done that? Uh-uh. That's I've, the one with... Um, I've not been to Disney World in ages. It's the Epcot one with the motion simulator. Okay. It, it's awesome. It gives you like half a G-force feeling. Half a G? Like, wow. Maybe a little more. Sounds Disney. Give me the full G. Uh, I know. Um, it's awesome. We expect this to be awesome as well. They also showed off one more ride, a dark ride. It's going to be one of those, like, you're in a yeah. car, and you get you move along a tram, and well, you're going through the corridors. They, ma- they, they made this sound like it was an even bigger deal than the Millennium Falcon ride. They said this is the most epic ride they've ever made for their parks. Rise of the Resistance is what I they're am, calling it. I am stoked. A dark ride, a Star Wars dark yeah. ride. yeah. That's great. Yeah, and I like think so too. Kylo Ren is going to be in it. Yeah, that's that's when they kind of lost me. Just give me Darth Vader. <laughs> just give me Darth Vader. Kids love <laughs> Kylo. I, I'm worried that it's just going to be you riding around in a dark ride, and they give you blasters, and you have to shoot things. Oh, like the Buzz Lightyear. Oh, thing? that'd yeah. be cool. Or the Men in Black one. Mm-hmm. No, I think it's going to be more story driven. I do too. I think it's you're going to watch a story unravel. You're going to oh, like a door is going to open. You're going to go inside a hangar and see one of those ATATs, and then you're going to back away, and it's going to spin you around. Like Indiana you. Jones. Yeah, like, just like Indiana Jones. Exactly. I'm sure the rides are going to be awesome, but what I loved is the sneak peek of the land itself and like seeing the Millennium Falcon there yeah. with like the, you know, exhaust vents, you know, shooting out smoke, and you can walk right up to it, and there's stormtroopers around like talking to people. I, if that's what the experience is, a bunch of like pairs of stormtroopers coming up to you and being like, "Hey, ID, please move along here," well, like that kind of stuff. Previously, we've heard in. we've heard that they're somehow creating a role playing aspect to that whole land, where mm-hmm. as a visitor, you'll be able to develop a character that mm-hmm. applies to wherever you go, and the, the choices that you make will affect how other characters interact with you. So and they, we didn't get any hints of that here, but like I could see the stormtroopers 
you know, applied that way. Like they come up to you and they ask you for your ID and then they'll say like, thank you for your service. Or they'll say like, you know, you need to come with us. Sponsored by Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, related to Star Wars, this is an article that surfaced uh, for me on Twitter this past weekend, but uh, a two-year-old article, I think it might be uh, interesting to you, Jeremy, since you recently worked with Sean to make an arcade game. Yes. This was... Uh, a retrospective on the making and design of the Atari Star Wars cabinet, the cockpit cabinet. Now, you, you everyone out there, is, if you've been to an arcade in the 90s or 80s, you've probably seen this. It's probably the, one of the best designed cabinets. Well, the game itself is a color vector game, which was awesome at the time. Plus, it had speech, right? Yeah. So it was digitized like, speech. Yeah. Red it, five standing by. And it was it was an interesting game because uh, it played on loop essentially. You played a Death Char. Uh, attack and trench run yeah. and then you played it again and it got more difficult and you played for score um, and some of the interesting things that came out of this article it's on arcadeblogger.com just search Atari Star Wars cockpit development but the game was originally another game called Warp Speed really? and then uh, that an Atari engineer wanted to make with the same graphics and when they got the license to do Star Wars then they just ported it over add the effects Wow! but then once that happened they had time to develop the cabinet itself and there's two versions of this. There's the stand-up version and the cockpit version. And the cockpit version, uh, they have photos of the mock-ups, the cardboard mock-ups, which you guys can relate to as you built Star Lords, building foam core mock-ups. Yep. Uh, and also the art aesthetic, uh, just great production design artwork. There's even photos of George Lucas testing the cabinet to give his final sign-off <laughs> before they reached it. They sold like 12,000 cool. of these, which is awesome. Wow. Still fun neat. to play. When you, when you go to an event like California Extreme or we can find this in the wild, it's really, really fun to play. Uh, one last bit, Netflix thing, a recommendation. We'll mention this on Still Untitled a couple weeks back, but there's a Netflix documentary series called Seven Days Out. Have you guys heard of this? Oh, I watched some of this. This is also pretty intense because I've lived this life a little bit. If you are interested, if you like documentary series, but maybe you don't want like a two-hour documentary series, these are like 45-minute documentary episodes. The premise, I think, was brilliant. They document the seven days leading up to a big event. So whether it is the reopening of the best restaurant in the world or the lead up to the Westminster Dog Show, the seven days leading up, how the organizers revamp a space, how the competitors prepare, uh, the seven days leading up to an eSports League of Legends championship, North American championship, uh, the Kentucky Derby, uh, NASA's, um, what was it, a Cassini uh, crash into Saturn, and uh, what was the last one? Oh, and a fashion show, a uh, Chanel f- uh, fashion show. You get a lot of insight week. into event production, which gave me a little PTSD. <laughs> it was for the years. There's some things that left to be desired. I think they're very different episodes. The NASA one I thought was unfortunately the weakest. It was because the there wasn't that much. There's it's very intangible, right? Yeah. What they were doing, and so they had to make it more of a human interest story. And then I think, of course, it went through the NASA PR ringer, so you could, they couldn't communicate any drama. Uh, but there's a lot of drama in some of the the other episodes. But if you're interested in not only event production but like crunch time for people setting up big things and what goes on behind the scenes, like the Westminster Dog Show, which is the first one, love that episode. It is January 2019 now. And as we have entered the new year, mm-hmm. public domain is taking effect on a lot of new properties or old properties, I should say. Copyrighted works, all copyrighted works published in 1923 are now in public domain with some exceptions. Well, there was a huge exception 20 years ago, right? We're Where, talking about Disney. Well, all. 1923 properties were supposed to go public domain, but then there was an extension uh, proposed and passed by Congress that gave... Under heavy lobbying exactly, pressure. Obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, and that extended all of those properties for 20 years. 20 more years. A fifth of a century. And yet, here we are. And now those works have finally fallen into the public domain. 
and it's the first time that that's happened in 20 years. This is it's, it's new territory because now we're much more aware of the public domain fight. Uh, the internet is in a completely different place uh, where doc works are already shared, and we're going to reach a point because, uh, as we know, the the biggest IPs such as Mickey Mouse, Batman, Superman, uh, at some point in the next two decades will fall under a public domain. Now, what does that mean for people who want to publish those works or use those works commercially? I don't think it's... I think it's going to have an impact on the fringes because I don't think it's going to change... Like, no one's going to put out, like, a Batman movie that Warner Brothers doesn't put out and DC doesn't put out to go see. But I think when it comes to, like, licensing for toys and licensing for art and that stuff... I think that's going to um, impact that industry greatly. I think we've already seen that. Every time you go to a con, you see a lot of unlicensed stuff already. Uh, so I, I hope it brings down the prices of some of that stuff and opens up, uh, invites more people to participate in, the, in that realm. So some of the more interesting things about this is that while it may sound like in come 2024, uh, Mickey Mouse will be in public domain, you know, barring another heavily lobbied extension by Walt Disney Company. Uh, but what we're actually going public domain is Mickey Mouse as he appeared when he in was Steve first created, Willy. in Steamboat Willie. So yeah. it's not the modern. They still have the commercial rights and and all the trademarks for Mickey Mouse as he has evolved. And so it will be tricky for the courts to kind of sift through and if these things if C&Ds get sent out um, and I'm really curious what you know what the commercial landscape will look like will we see an influx of Steamboat Willie products just in the marketplace yeah. <laughs> will demand increase I don't think there is much demand for it I I watched um, a lot of Adam Ruins Everything this show from Adam Conover that's on True TV uh, over the break with my kid and he does a great episode on the on this copyright breakdown and the lobbying efforts that went in 20 years ago and one of the things that came up from one of the experts on that show is there's also a ton of stuff that fell under that rule that was sort of orphaned content that wasn't this famous Great Gatsby, Steamboat Willie, that kind of public domain kind of stuff that will also become available now. Um, and because it's orphaned, there's no owner for it. They've just been sitting there dark. So I actually think one of the more interesting things about this public domain is unearthing a lot of content that uh, you know that just kind of sat on the shelf mm -hmm. for a long period of time probably most of it's garbage you know but you know there's probably going to be a few gems in there yeah uh, moving on to phones because we are getting around to CS time a couple bits of phone news the essential phone this was um uh, Andy Rubin's company. He started after he left Google, and of course, that leaving of Google has now been big news because of the this terms and situations in which uh, he left. But the company he started up, Essential, created a pretty good phone uh, a year and a half ago, and it was actually hugely discounted uh, on Black Friday. You get real cheap. It doesn't work great on all carriers, but it turns out that phone probably is dead. Essential has confirmed they are no longer going to be restocking that phone. They're going to be thinking about new products. And while some people speculate they're going to be working on an Essential Phone 2, it's probably unlikely. That's a very expensive venture. And given the new kind of public, uh, the PR troubles and the optic troubles of, of Andy Rubin, it's, uh, the company is probably not going to exist the way it's been existing. I think we're in a huge decline in competition in the, in the phone space. Because, because the, it's so expensive to launch a phone and penetrate anything beyond Google and Apple. And the Pixel phones are good. Uh, I mean, Samsung as well, right? So... I mean, there's like a few major carriers that are going to dominate the the space. Nokia is still out there too. I just have a hard I don't see time them dominating anything. No, but I mean, like it's hard to break in as a new operator with with that much stuff happening, which is a shame because I I do think some innovations, especially cost uh, pressure, was coming from that market. Um, for all the what's the one the one plus phone which you know has had its ups and downs i think it, it kept google a little bit honest about prices on some of the pixel phones and as the one plus has sort of declined i think that's given google free range to be to go where apple is and start raising to four figure kind of phones will essential future. owners be able to install future versions of android uh, so as of uh, so far yes okay 
Uh, and uh, speaking of Nokia, uh, this is something that will probably get unveiled more at CES next week. But Nokia 9, um, there are some photos of it. And this is a, a phone with five cameras on the back. Okay, good. And so it was. Uh, it looks freaky, like that. What was that camera last year that had like nineteen lenses? Yeah. On it? Oh gosh, what was that? It was way too bulky. It was more a tablet than a phone. Well, but, it wasn't a phone. It was a camera. That right. thing, right? But this has a reminiscent of that. So, it's what like, does this use so many lenses for? It does it for for light. It does com- uh, computer vision. Compu- I'm sorry, computational photography uh-huh. to <laughs> stitch the your images. favorite term, Jeremy. I do like it. Stitch the terms, and they say. With five simultaneous shots, will allow ten times more light compared to one sensor. So, is it used for depth of field computations? It could be for that. It could be for just just sheer low biggest low light, just uh, or the, the megapixel of the image. I, I, we don't know until hmm. this phone uh, will will get released. Crazy. But Google's already done some amazing stuff with their computational photography. The night sight is night sight is magic, and I know we've talked about it before. I used it all the time in Yosemite. It yeah. is. Magic, you like it? I love it. It is is so incredibly useful the ins- the, the, and e- easy to do. The too. exposure isn't too long to make things blurry. I mean, if there's something moving in the background, but it compensates for that. Hmm. Um, it just takes time to process. You're trading yeah. extra time in the processing for a photo to to get a good photo. But how many times are you in a situation? And, and so I initially thought of that that tool as being just as a nighttime feature. Yeah. And then I started realizing I'm in all these spots, especially in Yosemite, where something is lit in the background and not in the foreground just because of the way the sun falls. That's a really common situation that everyone hits. Absolutely. And the night sight made everything blend a whole lot better Does it, in terms of lighting. You mean it, it does it like an HDR effect or it overexposes the background? Uh, well, I, it tends to overexpose the... Well, oftentimes in Yosemite, I had an exposed background and underexposed four. And so it helped a lot in that situation. Got it. We even with poor internet, it was working. Oh, well, it didn't seem to depend on that. Actually, I had pretty good reception in Yosemite. So the whole process is cloud based. I that's my my thinking is that it's cloud based. How long does it take to take one? Um, a second. We maybe? should demonstrate it. So you can't fast shutter and then pick the best shot you want. Mm-hmm. It, it, which is funny because you've seen and Google's been playing a bunch of ads that basically play to both those, right? There's the fast shutter where you get the perfect snap and you yeah. pick the one where right. your eyes aren't blinking with good light, and then there's the the uh, they have this really great um, uh, uh, Flash Gordon soundtrack commercial about taking away Flash using Night Sight. Mm-hmm. Have you seen that commercial, Jeremy? No, but I like ah! it. I like it already. It's like they, yeah. there's a they, they the play they play the Flash theme. Gordon theme, and it's a bunch of uh, scenarios where the Flash is blinding people, like yeah. a singer on stage, and like people are being blinded by the Flash, and then because you don't need that with Night Sight. I also commercial. use them. Um, they have a photo scan feature that uses very similar techniques, where it sh- I I was taking pictures of my kids' art and scanning them in, mm-hmm. and it shines the the Flash down. But then sort of computationally takes out that flash in terms of the reflection. That's cool. By forcing it around. It, like going back to this Nokia phone, if if you can use the five lenses in this way, um, where you can have, you know, one of the lenses, you can change the F on it and like change the background for blurring. You can change the foreground in terms of lighting. And you, with five lenses, you should be able to do more uh, as long as the computational infrastructure is there. Uh I'm weirdly excited about this, even though this phone looks really st- stupid weird. It's, it needs to be put out into the market, and it will, the results will, will help sell it or not sell it. All right, this is a super, super cool story uh, that happened over the break. <laughs> okay. You don't think it is? No, it's, it's, I think it, you might be overselling it a little bit, but go ahead. I love this story. <laughs> There's a new piece of software called Doomba that can take the data from your Roomba <laughs> to create a doom level based on how the Roomba has mapped your house. Your, okay, yeah, your, your floor. Yes. Yeah. So what happens is that uh, the, the Roombas have some form, of, some form of slam, some form of location, localization and, and mapping where it creates a map builds onto that map so it knows where the corners are and knows places it can't go it knows where it can go so it knows how whether it's done full coverage of of uh your wherever you have it and it does it over a long period of time right and that data that map can be extracted 
from the Roomba. And uh, Rich Whitehouse, uh, developer, has then turned that map into a generated Doom level. And you can do it with any Roomba. Do you have a Roomba? I don't have a Roomba. It's uh, not any Roomba. It has to be the ones that have this mapping sure. technology. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. But yes. What's the model? Uh, it, uh, he only, he's only tested it with a Roomba 980 model is the one that has so that's presumably that and and newer. I don't know. I have a Roomba. Do you is, have one with the mapping? Uh, it's two or three years old. Oh, probably not. I don't know. I, I did Would not... you buy a new Roomba just <laughs> no, for this feature? I don't think so. And I didn't even know that Roombas had any kind of slam. I, I thought that they just had... Um, you know, they bump into things and they say, oh, can't go any further. No, there. no, no. Oh, the new oh, ones actually map. Yeah. Let me but turn it, around. The maps, uh, like, have been uh, generally reviewed as being pretty bad. They're mm. really noisy. Not like, yeah. I mean, you guys have played with the Magic Leap. That map that Magic Leap well, is creating is infinitely better. All they care about is the floor, surface area, the floor. Exactly. Yeah, right? they just want, are looking for really rough, like, spots so they know, like, not to fall off of, like, a... A staircase or something, exactly. and, right? and obviously the Doom levels have floor textures and wall textures. That's it. It's not your room. It's that's right, right. Yeah. It's not your exact room, but has the layout of your space. I just thought it was a, a cool, a cool implementation of the, taking advantage of the the slam in a Roomba. Yep, and Doom. Yep, for which uh, we hit a big anniversary last year. That's true. What twenty five years? Yeah, th- th- yeah, yeah. You guys use Instagram. I do. No, I'm I'm well past the Instagram. What? You're, age. you're what, what's? Oh, you. <laughs> the, the cutoff is 35. Oh, it wasn't you, that. You're you can't, past you, Instagram. You're post. You're not post Instagram. You can't use it if you're over 35. I don't think. Oh, sh- no. that is <laughs> not <Shoot>. true. <laughs> Clock's ticking. The, the gem true. is blinking <laughs> on my wrist. Uh, Instagram released a select number of users a beta test of a new interface that's was quite controversial, and they've rolled it back since. Horizontal scrolling. People are too sensitive. That's as why opposed I was... to vertical scrolling. I had it happen on my my Instagram really? account. Did you freak out? I, I did freak out. Why did you freak out? I mean, what's the big deal? I mean, you're swiping left instead of swiping up. Which I, the kids love swiping left and right, right? Yeah. Swiping left and right is what their thumbs are trained to do now. Uh, I think the illusion of a continuity in a stream is maintained more when you have a vertical when you have a vertical stream. Pull down to refresh, that's why? No, 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 because you see more, because phones are tall as opposed to wide. And so when I can see two or three posts at once as I'm scrolling, even though I know it's algorithm- algorithmically generated based on past history, based on you know the feed, um, it's, it's not a locked feed, which is what I think I, I truly want. Doing horizontal where you can only see at most two at once, it then the, the algorithm just makes itself apparent. I don't think it's just I'm- random matters with their aspect ratio on their on their square photos that much no I, i'm with norm because if you can see there's more then it makes you want to keep going and it makes me feel like I, I, have a, I have a mental list of what that stream has been and what i've seen before and what i've seen after and what's upcoming up as opposed to if i scroll left and right it's all mystery i mean you can always rotate your phone if you want a horizontal it doesn't support interface. That. it should it doesn't it should though that might be a smart way for them to, to implement this I think it's going to come out. I think that they were testing it. You think they rolled it back it's going to be a choice? I, no. A I think toggle? they're going to lock in because they want people to interact. And what the horizontal scrolling lets you do is a use extra vertical space to automatically load comments because they uh, want people to, to engage with comments. Oh, boy. As opposed to ha- clicking the comments button and seeing the whole stream of comments. So vertical scrolling is comments. Horizontal scrolling Stop is... Stop trying to control me. Well, Netflix. That was years ago that that train left the station (laughs) (laughs) Uh, some tesla talk tesla announced they delivered ninety thousand cars was just in the fourth quarter that sounds good it does sound good it isn't according to wall street tesla stock dropped eight percent on the news because they were supposed to be in the low hundred thousands Ooh, that's a lot of cars it is a lot of cars i actually uh, you know Wall Street is is obviously very volatile right now, so I don't know if you read too much in this, but it is definitely short of what expectations were. Yeah, December was like the worst month since the since the thirties, in terms of the Dow. Yeah, yeah and, it's bad news. A lot of factors going into that, uh, but for Tesla owners, they got an update, a sweet update over the holidays uh, for more Easter eggs. They got a romance mode, 
where what? you get a fireplace that plays on your screen. Oh. Uh, and I believe uh, Barry White plays. Really? Yeah. And you have a, a, a emissions testing That's mode, funny. which I is a, it. it's a, it's a joke mode. It actually, I've used it to great effect already with a baby in the car. Oh, yeah? Is that you can pick a spot. It is localized speaker audio. You can choose which seat to make it sound like a fart is coming from that seat. Oh, no. And you can activate it with your turn signal or activate it with one of the buttons on your scroll wheel. <laughs> so if you turn it on, and it resets every time you start the car, but you turn it on before your family gets in the car, yeah. you can make it sound like a person sitting on a specific seat, even your own seat. Just let one go. Is it convincing? It is so convincing. They have like 12 <laughs> different fart sounds, and they're randomized. Owner gets into car crash while trying to make his wife fart. Tell me you No, cannot. I made the baby fart. Oh. I made a baby fart, and I made it sound, and the baby was startled by it. But it, sound, it sounded like it came from the baby. Tell me that you played the Atari games. I played the Atari games. How, how is that? Very slow. What do, and, what do you mean? Uh, loading time is slow. What? Really? Huh. Yeah. The interface is cool. They do this like frame around it. Yeah. I did missile command and it like the scroll wheel controls. I did not like. Oh boy, that's disappointing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, last bits of news. Epic made a f ton of money. Yeah, I think we should go work there. <laughs> <laughs> On Fortnite, three billion dollars in profits. Wow. In Profit? That isn't just revenue. No, that's crazy. Like, I don't know what you do with that much money. I can tell you that my my son has probably spent more money on Fortnite than any other game. I mean, they they just like buying the skins and the dances. Can we stop calling it free to play then? We call some other name. I keep telling him, you know, you don't need this. It doesn't. If if it was, if it did affect how you played the game, if it actually had any impact on your skill in the game, that would be bad. Oh, of course. Thankfully, it doesn't. Well, I think they were smart about that. That would get people really mad. And yet they still want to be in the in the store game, you know? And I, so I wonder, how does $3 billion compare to what Valve made? I mean, when you look at this, though, do you does it give you a sense of dread for what comes next? Because everyone's going to co- I mean, we already see every game is now Battle Royale game. Yep. Everyone's copying Fortnite. Mm-hmm. Uh, is, is this even just another sign? Like, people are just going to chase that market. Free to play skins, all that. I mean, video Absolutely. games have been heading this way for a while now. Yeah. But I, to me, like, I, there's some part of me internally that like sheds a tear seeing this information. Props to Epic for making this much money and and making a game that has still like kept people's attention and having a little fun with it as they go along. But what this means for the industry, probably not great. I'm a big fan of games that cost money and there's no I'm in-app, with you. in-app purchases. And even Nintendo, when they released Mario on iOS, they made that pledge and they've made tr- they've made good on it. It's good good for them. Do you think um, st- like p- uh, video game companies are making decisions now on what games people want to just watch be streamed as oh opposed to just being played? I don't think so. Because that's part of the success of Fortnite. I think isn't just playing it, is that people want to yeah, watch but, people but play. But that's it. a dog chasing its tail. I mean, you can't have the audience without a successful game. So you need to have a lot of people yes, who, and, like, who want to play the game. To but be the thing is, even some of the esports games that are out there aren't really watchable. Like Dota 2, not entirely a watchable game. For new, I mean, that's what do esports streams have like two audio feeds, one for noobs and one for the pros? No, I don't think so. Like, wouldn't that make a lot of sense? Yeah. If you're, if you're, I, I have no idea. I've never played League of Legends, but like, after watching that documentary series, I'm kind of curious about League of Legends, and I don't understand what the commentators are saying because they're using shorthand and they're talking really fast and they're speaking to people who are experts of the game who know all the characters. Why can't there be a dummy? commentator stream it's like you know flip the audio feed instead of sa sap for for well, noobs you know or you know digitally you can just choose the audio track you want the alpha go commentary guy sure who, like introduces you to the concepts yeah yeah, yeah. the and technology there's no is there there's should, no reason technology isn't idea. there and maybe maybe it's out there already i i don't know if there is someone let me know and i would that would get only me watching seen, those streams yeah. i've only seen multi languages i've never seen streams have a second audio track like that. That would be awesome. Speaking of Nintendo, you can now play a new 
Nintendo game on your Nintendo Entertainment System. What? From 1984. Do you have to buy a cartridge? What, what, what am I doing? Well, apparently there was a game called Sim City. You ever heard of it? I've heard of the brand. It came out on the PC, obviously, and Mac and everything else, but it also came out on the Super Nintendo. And apparently it was at the end of the Nintendo's life cycle, the, the NES's life cycle. And they were developing it for the NES. Yeah. But then they abandoned it, brought it to SNES, released it there. But the NES version sat, you know, on a shelf somewhere, and they've unearthed it. And it came out, they released it on Christmas. And you can download it, and you can play it on a NES. And it, you can compare it to the SNES version and see all the differences. And it's not complete because they abandoned it, but it's very close to completion. It's like a late alpha. I just got a sense memory of the f- receiving my first Nintendo. My parents were the first spot for me. So here's like a here's all the icons. Uh, you can compare the icons between the two different. And oh, pe- yeah. some people some people are saying, you know what, the SNES lost a little bit of the yeah. of the personality. The yeah. In translation. Mm. So the NES version's out there, and you can play a, a, a brand new NES game that isn't complete. <laughs> what an Easter egg. Who knew? Indeed. Are you going to say something here? Yes, I am going to say that this episode of This Is Only a Test is also made possible by Triple Byte because applying to programming jobs sucks. You have to put the right keywords in your resume. You spend hours and hours on phone screens and take-home projects, and that's assuming the company even responds to your application. Well, if you're a software engineer, TripleByte can help. They work with over 400 top tech companies from big names like Dropbox and Adobe to exciting startups. You do one brief online interview with them, and if you do well, you go get straight to the final interview with companies on their platform. It's like the common app for software engineers. TripleByte does not look at your resume or where you went to school. All they care about is if you can code. Many times in my life, I know a bunch of people not having that degree or the resume has not gotten them in the door when I know they've been capable enough to get in because really what matters is whether they can do the work and whether they are qualified from a day-to-day basis, not just that diploma. So apply now at triplebyte.com slash test. That's triplebyte, B-Y-T-E, byte is an eight bits, dot com slash test. And as a special offer for listeners of This Is Only a Test, if you take a job through Triplebyte, they'll offer you a $1,000 signing bonus. So thank them for making this episode possible. Moment of science. I want to shout out myself. Uh, I put out a top 10 list of science stories of the year on Twitter earlier this week, uh, as promised. Uh, I want to highlight just a couple of them before we get into this week's news. There are stories about uh, finding a neutrino from uh, 4 billion light years away in a galaxy far, far away, uh, uh, coming from a a place called a blazar that hit these detectors perfectly in uh, buried under the ice in Antarctica. Really interesting. We talked about, I talked about the Denisovans interbreeding with Neanderthals and that discovery in a Siberian cave. I talked about um, all the scientists that ran for political office, uh, the national Academy report on sexual harassment in science, which was really eye opening. Uh, the passing a number of uh, scientific luminaries uh, the rise of single cell RNA sequencing, which giving us cell by cell information, uh, and e- even what the Golden State Killer means when we spit into those 23andMe type DNA tests. Uh, I think it's a great read. You should check it out. It was a lot of fun to put together. On to this week's news. So while all of us were having our muted New Year celebrations, programming, playing tabletop games with Will, or going to sleep early, NASA decided to stay up. You were changing a diaper. Oh, yeah, changing a diaper. Sorry. It was more exciting than tabletop (laughs) games with Will. Um, NASA decided to have its own party because the New Horizons probe, spacecraft, whatever you want to call it, is out in the Kuiper Belt, which is the band of asteroid-like kind of objects beyond at the edge of our solar system. And they kind of picked an object at random that they would be able to go to uh, called uh, uh, 2014 MU69, and they did a flyby of it on 
uh, well, they did a flyby on it a few days earlier, but they got started receiving telemetry from New Horizons that it flew by on New Year's Eve slash day, uh, depending on your time zone. Now, this is beyond Pluto, where this spacecraft is. What do you think the data rate is coming back to Earth? The data rate? I don't know. 300 baud. It's actually better than that. It's almost oh. a kilobit an hour, actually. So worse than that. <laughs> kilobyte or kilobit? Uh, byte, yeah. Kilobyte. 1 KB. 300 an hour. baud is 300 bits per second. Yeah. yeah. Much worse. Mm-hmm. <laughs> or, or does a magnitude worse than that? It's, it's not per hour. It's per second. Sorry. Oh, it is. So it's a, a kilobyte uh, or a bit? Yeah, kilobit per second. Uh, okay, okay, that's pretty good. That's not bad. That's not, that's bad, not bad at all. That's not bad but at all. isn't it like a light hour away? Uh, No, it's not a... Uh, or is it a, how far away is it? Yeah, throughput and latency are very different things. Or, it's pretty far. No, it's, it's more than that. It's like a, a day away, a light yeah, day. Yeah, it's a light day away. Yeah. What did you... Did you say a light I mean, year I away? I said hour, oh, but hour. I, meant, I meant day. Yeah, so it it's far. It is far. It is far. To get that kind of transmission rate, that's pretty good. Wow. So they're starting to assemble the information from it. We got our first image uh, as we're recording this podcast. They had the press conference, released an image oh, of this object. We saw the blurry pixelated. We saw a blurry pixelated image of like what looked like a peanut. Enhanced. And it was tumbling (laughs) over end over end. And so they did enhance, enhance, enhance on it. And it looks like BB-8. It literally looks like BB-8. Two Two spheres. It connected. is two spheres. It's a snowman. And on the top sphere, there's two places that are slightly brighter uh, just because of how the image um, projected. And it freaking looks like BB-8. It looks a lot like BB-8. So is that an actual enhanced version of what we already received? Or yeah, it, it's the is, more detailed data assembled this image. But it took more data to assemble that. Yeah. Very cool. So some of the images you saw yesterday during the initial flyby were composites based off of what they've seen from telescopes yeah. and some of the initial data from New Horizons just confirming that it existed. So when they did enhance, 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 we got BB-8. Wow. Not too bad. No, I, I think still think it's crazy that they just picked a random object out in the Kuiper belt, flew a thing by it, and we're getting pictures back of this. Uh, the I was live streaming the... Um, the press conference earlier when we were talking about Bandersnatch, the NASA dude is like jumping out of his seat. He's so excited to see this kind of data. And because it has this weird shape, A, why does it have this weird shape? That is a re- like a snowman in space is kind of a strange shape. Maybe it's not as have. weird as you think. Yeah, and so, exactly. Um, and also it's probably tumbling kind of in this kind of weird way as well because it has that shape. So which it's going to give us all sorts of information about this. I love that that space is so predictable because of weightlessness and lack of air and, and physics. We know where things are going to be and we can send things to them. We have mm-hmm. the number of variables. That's is really mm-hmm. cool. It's determinate. The fact that they're able to do it with such regularity too is amazing. Uh, one other piece of information that sort of dropped while we were away is that the uh, Trump administration has, Uh, has indicated that its EPA is going to roll back regulations of mercury emissions from coal-fired power plants. And I want to bring this up because this is actually an area of expertise for me. Um, uh, I had a whole business related to um, capturing mercury from uh, from carbon sources and did some work in coal-fired power plants. Uh, This is um, one of those things that I call sort of a big deal. So the way um, typically this works, and I'll speak to U.S. specifically, is one of the largest sources of coal in the U.S. is in Wyoming. It's called PRB coal. This coal is younger than most of the stuff sort of on the East Coast because as sort of pressure built and um, plates collided, um, the coal like hardens and it it tends to drive impurities out of it. Uh, That's why in Pennsylvania... Uh, we see something called anthracite, which has uh, it's a much more uh, carbon rich uh, p- piece of coal than the coal you see out in Wyoming. Well, the stuff in Wyoming has a lot of impurities in it, and one of those is mercury. And so when you burn coal, mercury goes up in the air. And as the winds push it west to east, it tends to do two things. One is leaves of deciduous trees will take up that mercury from the air and put it into the soil 
And guess what the east coast of the U.S. and North America has lots of? There's a lot of deciduous trees. Second thing it does, it'll just fall into water. And the best, what's called a bioaccumulator of mercury on this planet, besides microbes, are fish. And so the fish will convert that mercury that's been blown out into the air, whether it's elemental mercury or mercury 2 plus, and start to bioaccumulate it until it forms something called methylmercury. That can go up the food chain. And as we eat fish, as humans, uh, it gets into our system. Methylmercury is a potent sort of, uh, in high doses, neurotoxin. It's been linked to developmental issues. The reason uh, the, the EPA is rolling back these uh, regulations is that to sort of capture the mercury out of these coal-fired power plants, you basically have to take some of the air that's coming out of the, the coal plant as it's sort of spinning a turbine and shunt it off to the side to capture some of the mercury. So you're taking away some of their like energy production by doing this regulation. Um, and uh, by restoring this regulation, you're making them slightly more efficient. But this is the largest source of mercury emissions on this planet. And that bioaccumulation doesn't go anywhere. It just stays in the system. There's no way to get that mercury out. And so there's no re as far as we can tell, there's no justifiable reason to roll back this regulation from a health standpoint. It doesn't even make that much business sense from the analytics that I've seen. Um, there's some great researchers that I really recommend reading. Uh, some of their their papers. Noel Celine at MIT um, put out um, uh, uh, some really easy to read op eds uh, detailing uh, some of the issues of this long term with the rollback of this. Uh, so I being connected with the science, seeing this happen in industry, I would say this is one of those that really uh, drove me insane over this holiday. Uh, period, because this one just doesn't make any sense for us from a human health standpoint. Just optics, maybe, or the or appeasing a base. The benefits of the plan will, might be four to six million dollars for these companies over the course of the year. Ah, money. Yeah, that's not much money. Got actually. it. Million. That's nothing. <laughs> The VR Minute, virtual reality this week. Have you read this? A little bit of ominous well, research. Did you read it? The The Guardian has published a, uh, well, they didn't publish the, the report. The Leeds University. Leeds University actually did a report, and The Guardian reported on it. Uh, they, they took a handful of kids, not even that many, 20. 20 and, kids. And they put them in VR for 20 minutes. And they found it's possible that there are undetermined health risks. They had one child come out who was um, very dizzy after a while, after 20 minutes. And for a while, after taking the headset off, uh, showed signs of being dizzy. And uh, two or three of the, of other, the other kids um, had trouble uh, focusing on things. Hmm. But both of those symptoms went away. Right, not quite a longitudinal study. This is like no, no, twenty no. people, twenty subjects, one demo. You should read the author of the study wrote a medium post oh, uh, yeah? detailing this, and I and I read it, and then I read the paper that they put out, and it's a much more reasonable take than the Guardian uh, piece. Like while he's definitely uh, says that there are probably short term effects associated to VR and developmental um, situations, like with kids. Like, we can understand why balance would be a problem in VR mm -hmm. and understand why vision would be a problem for certain people in VR, especially if it's not sort of calibrated right to their PD and, and, and whatever. His larger point was that these are real, tangible, physical risks that people come out having short-term issues with. We don't know what long-term consequences are. And designers aren't taking these potential issues into account when they're designing games. He thinks that uh, part of like him putting out the study was the idea of just being a cautionary note that uh, we can't sort of introduce the element of surprise in terms of like suddenly you're falling in VR, things that will mess with your sort of physical state um, as quickly as you would in a two day game just because of potential lingering effects after you take the headset off. And so I found that to be a reasonable statement. 
in the context of this. Yeah. Because it was just a warning to designers. Right. We need verifocal headsets. Uh, Well, the problem, like these symptoms could be shown by adults too. Uh, There's plenty of people who become uncomfortable with the headset and have to rip it off themselves. Um, Do you know for a fact whether or not the headsets were calibrated for the IPD of the kids who were using them? Because none of the consumer VR headsets have that level of calibration. Mm -hmm. Um, Anyway, uh, you know, it's good practice not to put a VR headset on your child for very long because there are no studies on this, and the headsets aren't designed for their eye distance. So I've always said that my kids could use it for 20 minutes a week. Uh, Now that my son is getting older, maybe a little bit more, but uh, it is something to be aware about. But the threat of any kind of long-term consequences for tw- after 20 minutes yeah seems pretty suspect. i'm skeptical of any sort of number being placed on this at this point yeah anyways in terms of like developmental damage and frankly i think it's hard to be in a vr headset more than a couple hours anyways oh uh, the, that those ergonomics problems i think will solve themselves soon i don't i don't expect and and there are very few experiences we're going to want to be in in the experience for that much time anyway well how about eight months in VR? Yeah. What? Because <laughs> That's too long. <laughs> that, there's a Las Vegas challenge for you. How long could you stay in VR? Yeah. Someone did 24 hours. I can see that. I remember that was like years ago when they did a 24 hour in VR. Um, what would your number be? Oh, I don't want to spend more than two hours. No, I'm good. I, w- we could talk about it if there's a, if there's money involved. Of course, of course. Let's say let, we're not making it. We're, we're, we're just no no real prop bets happening here. We're in California, but let's say like, what was the offer? What was a hundred thousand yeah. dollars on the line? Yeah, a hundred thousand dollars. Okay, how long would you be in VR? I don't I don't know, man. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. More than twenty four hours. That's a long. That's a lot of money. How about wireless headset though? Uh, <laughs> I I do a week. Wow, that's a lot of money. It is a lot of money. All I got to do is lie there. You know, I could close my eyes for a week. No. Yeah, I could. No, you could. Yes, yeah, like for a hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> you think that... you guys underestimate me. Huh? <laughs> I think it'd have to be longer than a week, because with VR you get interactivity, you get the brain stimulation. Uh, you don't I have think any of all the... of this doesn't matter until we talk about the content that you have to use for twenty-four. Hours. Jump, nothing but horror games. I'll just keep yeah. it off. Nothing but horror. Nothing. Nothing but dread halls. <laughs> Made for one week edition. Jump scares. Yeah. Everywhere you look. Sounds like a Black Mirror episode. Oh, this this is well, Charlie Brooker. There you go. All right, so more than Here's the challenge. According to Polygon, uh 4600 elite dangerous players are going to embark on an 8-month journey to the edge of the galaxy. I imagine these are the most experienced, most Not hardcore. necessarily. No, you you would think so. But anybody can join this as long as they have upgraded their ship to the minimum spec. Got it. So you need to have like the proper jump drive. I forget what they call it. Uh, but you need to have like enough power in order to make the jumps that they're going to make. Yep. And they have actually designed, uh, sketched out their route such that the least powerful players will still be able to keep up. And it's a convoy. In a sense, but only about a dozen or so ships can actually sync up on a server. Sure. So they're going to time it so that all of the servers can sort of be in sync virtually. For the events. Even though you won't be able to see everybody. Right. But That's a little less interesting, but it's a cool, it's a, it's a cool idea. It's it, getting those thousands of people yeah, something to do for eight months. To do the same thing. And apparently, um, what's the name of the company that makes it? I forget. Uh do, 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 do. Anyway, the company that, that designed the game, they're, they're, they love the idea, obviously, and they will be... Um, Frontier. Frontier. They'll be adding little Easter eggs along the way, including some new technology that they'll be able to use at the center of the galaxy. Wow. Yeah. This is like a whole Battlestar Galactica thing. It's a big like migration of players. Yeah, except they're not planning to stay there. It's, it's a there and back again. How... how uh, what do they get when they come back? Or, or I mean, how long will it take to come back? Eight months. Eight months there, eight months back? No, I think it's eight months total. Oh, okay. I could be wrong about that, but I think it's eight months total. And there'll be, of those 4,600 players, uh, I think 80 of them are media who are what? going along to play the role of media and cover it. There will be like er, people. Norm, are, are you one of these there people? There are 80 journalists covering yeah. Elite Dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that to me is a shocking. Well,. When I they, think they count top Reddit posters, there'll be people playing the role of media. And the, 
other people will be playing different roles. You'll have like tour guides who will, you can go aboard each other's ships now, so you can go aboard and they can point things out, nebula and suns, and talk about what they see along the way. So how much of this stuff is procedurally generated at this point? I, well, I mean, path. it's every star in our galaxy. I, I would imagine most of it. Yeah. So what will be synced up? Will there be, will, is, is Frontier Developments going to insert events at certain locations and seed yeah, events right. now? You're passing MU69 now. Right, and, <laughs> and, and special encounters well, happen? the cool thing is, like, in, in the game, you get naming rights to anything you discover. And so there'll be a lot of that along the way, I would think. There'll be minor. Oh, that's gonna descend into all sorts of shenanigans. Yeah. This is less interesting than like Eve's, you know, multi hundred thousand people fights. It once. feels like there's more at stake with that Eve. Yeah. Situation uh, because there's a battle. Events. There's there's real money at stake. Hmm. Uh, but this is cool. It is it is a little more Star Trekky. Like yeah. we're on an exploration. Yeah. The problem with the game is it's very grindy. And so in order to get the the money you need to upgrade your ship, you just got to do boring stuff. And I guess that's life and they they've done a good job of simulating that. But at the same time, like I just like the the game is so cool. When you get into that cockpit and you hear the roar of your engine, the rumble, and you can fly and the physics feel right, like there's just so much potential there. And just, and you have groups of people playing together. Yeah. And I just wish that I could be hooked by something more than mundane, you know, piracy. Uh, we got uh, one more bit of VR news. Uh, this one comes via Ars Technica. Uh, developers of Project Cars, that's a racing game series, and they have a very excellent VR implementation. Uh, they have announced, or CEO announced, that they're going to s- start developing a gaming box for VR gaming for living room. Now, a console? A console for VR. The Project Cars guys are going to make a console? Presumably for racing games. I, I'm i going to interpret this because the, the interview that our second does with their CEO, it really sounds like it's a lot of speculation and it's early, a lot of big stuff being thrown at the walls and and like there's no real concrete information about what this console could look like. But my speculation is that it does make sense and they want to make a dedicated VR machine for racing games. Because people who build out racing rigs already yeah. spend a ton of money, and if you have something that's all in one, inclusive, something that kind of fits, feels like it would fit in a uh, either a very high end living room where you could have a dedicated chair and, and system and VR headset and their game, of course, uh, or even location based racing experience, then I could see this making sense, like an all in one hardware software racing game VR experience. It just seems like such a niche that you're talking about, such a small number of units that you it's a lot, so lot much it. effort to... I mean, the point of a console is to lower the point of, like, the barrier to entry. But at the point where you're talking about racing games and simulations where people are willing to spend the money yeah. on the hardware, it could make sense. But aren't those people who are happy being PC gamers? Yes, they are, yeah. presumably, unless it runs better on this or, or it's exclusive to this. I don't think it'll run better. It would just be easier to use. Yeah. I, I, at some point, it's just going to be a PC to another box. Yeah. Right. Running maybe at, at best, you know, their front end for for Steam. Weird. Okay. Well, that'll be fun to watch. Yeah. And that's uh, Mad Studios. A slightly Mad Studios. Sorry. Well, it's a slightly mad idea. I think that does it for this week's episode. The first of our year. We're just getting geared up for this year. Uh, Can I make a recommendation real quick? Please. Uh, if you didn't watch the favorite things videos at the end of the year. Hold on. I, n- I never get to play this. Testing this week. Hey, what have you guys been testing? I want to recommend the Tested Favorite Things videos. There's so many of them this year <laughs> from all the contributors. Uh, they're really wonderful. You get a wide gamut. They're um, just an incredible bevy of products. Uh, and then Kate Savaker has uh, and Adam have the build of the Blade Runner blimp on the site now, which was an awesome watch. And seeing Kate work on that for the better part of almost a year, it feels like. Um, and seeing it uh, come to fruition. It's, it's one of the more amazing tested builds I've ever seen. 
Yeah, and those favorite things videos really hurt my wallet because I bought a bunch of stuff. I bought the book you recommended. Oh, all over the all map. All over the map. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, I bought some files. What'd you buy from files. my list? Yeah, I, mean, you... I already had it. Okay, let's go. Yeah, I didn't buy a Prusa. Oh, I'm probably I I have the Prusa. You, you didn't in buy my an, checkout. An Ar- o Vision. It's a little expensive. Huh. Okay. It was nice though. It's hundred bucks. Hundred and twenty no, for an Art Vision. Yeah, there's like 120, 130. Yeah, I put that money toward noise canceling. Can I can I give you a follow up on something? Sure. So I actually have been testing something myself over the Christmas break. I thought it would be the perfect time to install the Prusa MMU 2.0 multi material. That's right. Now I had the MMU one that I installed on my old Prusa, and I recommended this year the Prusa MK3, which I think is easily like one of the best pieces of tech I've ever owned. I built it, I bought it as a kit, I assembled it, it is a machine, it is an absolute, just I can count on it to print everything that I send to it. I love it, it's a great 3D printer. The MMU2 is supposed to be great as well, because it's from the same company. It is a disaster. (gasps) Oh no. It is an absolute disaster. And the forum is filled with people who who just can't even get the thing to print one successful print. And is, it, is it what's what's breaking down? The fill it's a it's a cool new design. In mm-hmm. theory, it's it's cool. It sends the filament down to the existing extruder, and then it prints as good as the MK3 would, or at what if you're using MK2.5. The old one was a Bowden system where the extruders were way up here. The the stepper mm-hmm. motors are way up on the frame, and so it, it wasn't quite as good a print if you used that one. So this one, it sends it down and it grabs it and it prints it like it normally would. But because the filament has to retract all the way back up to the frame every time now, it gets stuck. And it gets stuck in several different places. And there's a thousand settings that you can tweak. And there's a, there are a number of people who have gotten it working. As far as I can tell, they're all using the MK3. I'm actually in, I actually installed it on my 2.5. It's supposed to be 100% compatible with. And I'm telling you, if you go to the forums, it's, it's just... It's chaos in there because er- there's so many people who just can't get this thing working. Certainly not with with stock right out of the box. There's a couple people who say they have, but I'm telling you, most almost everybody has been spending weeks trying to get this thing working. And it's it's yes. not not a product I would recommend yet. But I, I know Prusa will figure this out. Is that the hardware problem or a software problem? I think that the, that there's going to have to be revisions to the hardware. Uh-huh. Maybe, hopefully, just 3D printed parts that we can make ourselves. Right, right, right. Uh, but possibly some more things. I mean, people have installed all kinds of mods, including like things involving springs, replacing part of the ex- of the hot end with a uh, a different what they call uh, heat break. Um, there's a lot of different things people are trying. I I have tried new um, Bowden, not Bowden tubes, but PTFE, the the tubes that the filament travels through, ones with wider inner diameters. There's a lot of things people are trying, and it's so frustrating not to be able to get the thing to print reliably. So that's where, that's what I've been testing, and it has not been happy. But the MMU previous version still works just fine. I gave that away. Oh. When I bought the MMU and I was about to install it, I took the old one apart, and I gave it away to somebody on Reddit. Wow. Yeah, so it's gone. Like It did work, and I miss it. Yikes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, wait, hopefully that fix will come soon. I'm sure that they'll figure this out. Prusa is a good company, and I know that he cares about his products. Um, I just think that they've been focused a lot on their SLA printer. Yeah. yeah. And uh, this MMU probably has a very small number of people who bought it, but a lot of people are, there's a lot of people buying it now because everyone's excited. So hopefully they'll figure this out. All right, that does it for this week. If you gave a great gift or received a great gift, let us know in the comments and uh, let us know what you thought about Netflix's Bander Snatch episode as well. You know, the director has said there is footage. There are golden Easter eggs, some footage that people may never see. Gold? What's a golden Easter egg? Just golden eggs, Easter eggs that are gold, made of gold. Hmm. Rare, ultra rare Easter eggs. Wow. Like may- people, people may never see. Is that like something that they can't unlock or that they didn't notice in the background yet? I don't know. Okay. Footage. No, definitely footage. 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 Crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I bet you're right about the phone call. That's that's what I'm, I'm hoping. All right. Uh, we got an outro this week? Yeah. This one is from Mad Cat and Co. Assume company. Hi there. I didn't see you. That's it.
allowed to curse on this podcast? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Shit explosions and after shards. That's it. Yeah. There you go. See ya.